Dr. Hopping is on the Zoom. He's going to appear. Good afternoon, everyone. I ask everybody to take their seats. You can call everyone out from the hallway to come in. We want to welcome you to our TV symposium in honor of World TV Day, which was um, March 25th yesterday. And I'm Dr. Marina Keller. I'm Dr. Don Chen. Our symposium is co-sponsored by New York Medical College, Westchester Medical Center, and the Westchester County Department of Health. So for a few brief opening remarks, we wanted to welcome up to the podium, Dr. Neil Schluger, the Dean of our New York Medical College. Dr. Renee Garrick. Dr. Renee Garrick, the Executive VP and the CMO of Westchester Medical Center. And Dr. Sherlita Amler, Commissioner of Health for Westchester Department of Health. Thanks, Marina. Uh, I'm Neil Schluger, the Dean of the School of Medicine here at New York Medical College. And on behalf of the college, I want to welcome all of you uh, for what I think is going to be a really excellent program this afternoon. Um, I have to say, in my life before I became Dean of the School of Medicine, I spent most of my academic and clinical career working in tuberculosis. I'm a TB doctor from way back, started my career running the directly observed therapy clinic at Bellevue Hospital in 1992 at the height of a big TB epidemic in New York. Um, and uh, TB has remained near and dear to my heart ever since then, uh, both, as I said, as a clinician and a researcher and as also as an educator, uh, it's still one of the most important things, I think, in public health. And uh, we're very happy at New York Medical College today to be able to host this conference, uh, which I think you'll find uh, really, really informative. We have, as I said, wonderful speakers, uh, and uh, we're just really happy to, to see you. I want to thank uh, Marina Keller, especially, for organizing this and all the great work that she has done to put it together. It was really her idea to begin with. And, and so, Marina, thank you very much. Don Chen, um, uh, the infection control officer, hospital epidemiologist at Westchester Medical Center, and uh, uh, Renee Garrick, the CMO at Westchester, our great clinical partner. And it's a, a special uh, honor and privilege to welcome Dr. Amler from the Westchester County uh, Department of Health. So uh, we hope you have a wonderful afternoon. And uh, I'll just turn this over to Dr. Garrick for some remarks. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. Um, I, I must confess, so I'm a nephrologist, and I'd say 95% of the time that I'm standing in this auditorium, it's to give a renal lecture. So if I start talking about the kidney, you'll have to forgive me, but it's wonderful to, to welcome everybody. This is a great opportunity to highlight the collaboration that goes on between the academicians and the public health sector, and the county health, and the state health sector, and, and the clinicians. And it's a great opportunity for us to work and to be sure that we bring the state-of-the-art evidence-based care to the residents of Hudson Valley. And the goal is to be sure that everyone who takes care of our patients has access to the most up-to-date information that's scientifically sound. And we're really grateful for all of you for coming. And we're really grateful to our ID team and to Dr. Schluger and to Dr. Shalita Amler for helping to put this together. And we're really looking forward to a great symposia and want to thank you all for coming. So, Dr. Amler. Now you talk about GFR. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. So, good afternoon and thank you again to our organizers. TB has always posed a public health threat and I think it often gets way too little attention. Here in Westchester, our county health department is responsible for monitoring all TB cases and providing the necessary medical and preventative measures to improve outcomes and prevent the spread of TB to others. Through our TB clinics in White Plains and Yonkers, we provide free screening as well as medical care and medications, including the new shorter four-month rifampin treatment for patients with active TB. For latent TB, we offer a three-month regimen of 3-HP under, of course, direct observed therapy and or the standard regimen of rifampin and INH. We also partner with our local physicians and practices by offering technical assistance when requested to help them manage their TB patients and limit community spread. 
We protect the community at large by quarantining active TB cases to limit the spread to others. We use direct observed therapy to ensure compliance with TB medications and to monitor for side effects. Latent TB cases receive direct observed therapy as well. It's important to note that in New York, all RTB services, including diagnostic testing, medication, hospitalizations, are provided at no cost if the patient is uninsured or underinsured. In summary, our health department does a great job to treat TB patients and prevent its spread, but we cannot and do not do this alone. As you'll hear today, it takes all of us playing our respective roles, collaborating together to mitigate this threat and protect the population. I especially thank the many different professionals who make this effort a success. Our pharmacists, nurse, receptionists, lab techs, epidemiologists, researchers, community health workers, and physicians. And I am pleased that we could all be here today to share our knowledge and expertise with one another. And I look forward to the informational presentations starting right now. Thank you. So thank you very much. Let's go ahead and get started. Our first speaker today will be Dr. Edward Halperin. Dr. Halperin is the Chancellor and Chief Executive Officer of New York Medical College and a Professor of Radiation Oncology, Pediatrics, and History. He is Provost for Biomedical Affairs at Turo University and is well-placed to enlighten us on the rich history of New York Medical College in caring for patients with tuberculosis. I'll turn this over to Dr. Halperin now, who will be joining us virtually. You should be able to share now, sir. There you go. All set one. Yes, sir. It looks good. Okay. Thank you, Juan. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to chat with you for a few minutes about the management of tuberculosis in the late 19th and the first half of the 20th century is seen through the records of New York Medical College, the Metropolitan Hospital and Medical Center of the City of New York, and what we now call Westchester Medical Center. My name is Edward Halperin. I'm the Chancellor of New York Medical College. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. In reference to this lecture, I apologize for not being able to join you in person. I'm confined to quarters recovering from a heart attack last month. I want to thank college archivist Nicholas Webb and administrative assistant Ashley McCarrick for help in preparing my remarks this afternoon. I'm going to touch on six themes. The geography of the islands of the East River between Manhattan and Queens and why they managed, managed to tuberculosis care the origins of the Metropolitan Hospital of the City of New York and its relationship to New York Medical College, an outline of the nature of tuberculosis care in the late 19th and the first half of the 20th century, some illustrative images of tuberculosis care at the Metropolitan Hospital. I want to touch upon racial and national origin discrimination in tuberculosis care and give you some examples of tuberculosis care at Westchester Medical Center and on the New York Medical College campus. First, a bit of a geography lesson. What are the islands of the East River between Manhattan and Queens, and why do they matter to this story? The name Roosevelt Island only comes into use in the 1930s when people in New York decide to name a group of islands after then sitting President Franklin Roosevelt. To the Dutch, when this was the colony of New Amsterdam, these islands in the East River between Manhattan and Queens were named after the Dutch farmers who farmed on the islands. Later, when the British took New Amsterdam from the Dutch, 
and named it in honor of the Duke of York, New York. These islands were named after the English farmers working the islands. They were called Blackwell's Island, Ward's Island, Randall's Island. They were distinct individual islands, but some of the land has been filled in between them to make them contiguous. When multiple asylums and hospitals were placed on these islands to get them away from proper New Yorkers, the group of islands was called Welfare Island. And then Welfare Island was renamed Roosevelt Island. The Metropolitan Hospital of the City of New York was founded by the faculty of New York Medical College in 1875. It is the longest relationship between a city hospital and a private medical college in US history. If you look at Roosevelt Island now, you see a rotunda. It is all that remains of the Metropolitan Hospital on what is now called Roosevelt Island. Here it is viewed from the Manhattan shore. Here is the ruins of the hospital in the period when the hospital moved from Roosevelt Island to Harlem. Now we're filling out the building in its original structure. It was originally created after the Civil War for the problem of alcoholism of Civil War veterans and the care of the mentally ill. It created an enormous number of jobs, probably for Tammany Hall to build a massive structure, a beautiful set of buildings. It was called by some the homeopathic hospital because New York Medical College had homeopathic origins in the 19th century. Look at the magnificent rotunda of the Metropolitan Hospital. Now let's get aboard a steam launch organized by Thomas Edison. And we're going to sail south on the East River in 1903. And let's take a look at the largest tuberculosis facility in the United States, the tuberculosis wards of the Metropolitan Hospital on the islands of the East River. Of course, we have to have a lighthouse. And you see the big fields that's because they kept goats and sheep and cows to provide fresh milk and cheese for the patients, good nutrition being important to the care of tuberculosis patients. As we pass the fields, we start to encounter the buildings of the Metropolitan Hospital, the regular wards and the tuberculosis wards, solarium, housing facilities for the workers, inpatient units you can see it's a massive set of structures <laughs> now having taken a quick look at the hospital Let's put this in historical context and understand the nature of tuberculosis care in the late 19th and first half of the 20th century. You are celebrating World Tuberculosis Day because it corresponds with the identification of the bacillus by Robert Koch in Germany. His work is reproduced in upstate New York by Dr. Trudeau. Trudeau establishes the archetype of the tuberculosis sanatorium in Saranac Lake, New York. He believes that the patient should get plenty of fresh air and sunshine at Saranac Lake out on the patio. This is reproduced in sun porches at Bellevue Hospital in New York City. City hospitals are designed with these open doors that you can roll the beds outside for plenty of fresh air. Now pay particular attention to these porches. We're gonna see these again in Westchester a little later in my remarks. Now, what about people who live in apartments in New York City and can't get any fresh air? Ingenuity, they create so-called apartment solaria 
in which the beds are placed up on jacks and the bed is slid out so the patient's head can be out the window and get fresh air and some sunshine. Children are encouraged to be outdoors even during their schooling to be sure there's plenty of fresh air and sunshine. Treatment of tuberculosis patients includes good nutrition, milk and eggs for the children in the TB hospital. Take the patients and their mothers out on the water. And so both New York and Boston have floating hospitals. These are mothers and children lined up to board the boat. Here's a nurse taking a temperature of the Bellevue floating hospital. Public health campaigns are important in the late 19th, to early 20th century to deal with tuberculosis, teach people the cause and the prevention of the disease. Have public health marches. All lives are sacred. Public health posters fight TB with sunshine, good nutrition, proper hydration, and rest. Obey the rules of health, including don't kiss the cute baby you might spread tuberculosis. Outdoor play in tuberculosis. Outdoor health is as necessary to health as food or sleep. At home, let the children play in the yard or on a well-guarded roof. At school, ample open-air playgrounds must be provided. The city that fails to provide public playgrounds may be forced to provide TB sanatoria. Public health campaigns are conducted throughout the United States. This picture is from Atlanta. Salic Waxman at Rutgers University identifies streptomycin, one of the drugs used to combat TB. The wonder drug fights TB, the New York Post reports in 1952. Patients begin to receive anti-tuberculosis drugs. And the last patient walks out of Saranac Lake in the 1950s and the sanatoria closes. At the height of the TB care in the city hospitals of New York, the largest facility was Metropolitan Hospital, well documented in reports of the Department of Public Charities. There's the rotunda. The buildings of the hospital, including inpatient male wards, operating rooms, full staff nursing team, a very lovely cottage for the superintendent of the Metropolitan Hospital, the main building of the TB infirmary, tuberculosis inpatient infirmary, female building for the care of TB patients, the patients on the veranda to get fresh air and sunshine on the island in the East River the infirmary's dining room to maintain good nutrition for the patients. The exterior of the dining room, note the windows that can be pulled up for fresh air and sunshine. The solarium viewed from the outside and the inside. An all season solarium, note the Franklin stove. Tents being maintained for sunshine for the patients the interior of the woman's solarium tent, the dietary kitchen, pediatric male TB boards, children's tents for fresh air and sunshine. It's not only about tuberculosis. Here's a ward for Hansen's disease on the island. Housing for the staff. By the time the bridge is built, Queens, the way ambulances and fire engines on and off the island is by a massive elevator that lowers vehicles from the bridge down to the island. Racial and national origin discrimination was closely tied into TB care. Yes, we have images of the heroine discreetly coughing up some blood, being nursed by the family, or Mimi singing her way through dying of TB and La Boheme but TB disproportionately visited the poor, the black, and the marginalized of society. There was bias. TB patients were intertwined with othering. We don't want those people around here. They spread disease. 
In an address in the New York Academy of Medicine, Dr. Knopf said, to my deep regret, I learned that new difficulties have arisen concerning the site of our future New York State Sanatoria. Fistophobia, an exaggerated fear of TB is the cause. What people must learn is that consumption is not contagious when the sputum is destroyed. It's hard to estimate how much hardship and suffering has occurred through fear of consumption it leads to real inhumanity. The municipal hospital facilities in New York City have never yet been adequate to house and comfort all the poor seeking aid. The main reason is the influx of foreigners each year who never get any further in the U.S. than New York City. A glance at the nationality of the patients in the TB infirmary will show this. Six-year statistics for TB patients admitted, and you see the mortality rate of about 30% at Metropolitan Hospital. Half the patients are referred to as natives of the United States. Half as natives of Ireland, Germany, Russia, Italy, Austria, and England. These are working people, TB patients employed as laborers, servants, drivers in the needle trades, sewing machine operators. These are four members of the New York Medical College male graduating School of Medicine class of 1913. 25% of the graduates of our class of 1913 were black. These are four of the graduates. I call your particular attention to the two men in the middle. These are Dr. Peyton Anderson and Dr. Henry Harding, who both served multi-year terms as president of the Harlem TB and Health Association, where they sought to address public health and civil rights issues to fight the spread of TB in Harlem. They organized graduate medical education courses for TB. Dr. Harding, this is Dr. Harding, was probably the first black member of the medical board of the New York State TB Sanatorium in the Adirondacks. This is Winifred Phillips, New York Medical College, School of Medicine, class of 1941, the recipient of the Crump Scholarship that could only be held by a deserving Negro and Negress, according to the will of Dr. Trump. She was chief of pulmonary medicine in the Manhattan VA, a fellow of the American TB Society. She had been a TB patient herself, probably the first black woman to be elected to the New York Academy of Medicine, class of 1941. We must take note of the important role of black nurses in the care of patients in TB sanatoria in New York. These are nurses on Staten Island's TB sanatorium. This is a mural honoring them. There's a book about them, The Black Angels, the nurses who helped cure tuberculosis. At Westchester Medical Center on the New York Medical College campus, the Sunshine Cottage on Sunshine Cottage Road is built for the care of pediatric TB and polio patients. The, my predecessor leading the college in the 1980s clearly made up story after story to placate the New York Times who wanted to know if he was going to not destroy the historical artifacts of the care of TB patients, but he did. These beautiful murals and etchings were in the uh, Sunshine Cottage to amuse the children with TB. They are long gone. This is Claude Munger, commissioner of the Grasslands Hospital, who built the Sunshine Cottage and who built the Munger Pavilion. Look at the patios. These are for patients to get fresh air and sunshine for TB. Remember? See how many of them there are in the building? Now we're in the lobby of the Sunshine Cottage. This peculiar looking fountain was invented by the Halsey Taylor Company who made the double bubble drinking fountain, but they didn't want anybody with TB to put their mouth near the source of water. So this is an anti-tuberculosis drinking fountain. You can only get the water by filling a bottle or a glass. Can't bring your mouth near the source of the water. Remember the TV show, I've Got a Secret? Bill Cullen, Bess Meyerson, Gary Moore, and for years, Betsy Palmer, part-time Broadway and movie star. She was very interested in TB. Here she is at the Grasslands Hospital, Westchester Medical Center. She's talking to Dr. Ruth Girolamo, graduate of New York Medical College, First woman chair of diagnostic radiology at Westchester Medical Center and Metropolitan Hospital. 
She's showing her chest x-rays for TB. Here's Betsy Palmer meeting pediatric patients, occupational therapy patients, and on the sun porch to meet the TB patients. Hope you've enjoyed our historical excursion and thank you for your attention this afternoon. With Dr. Keller, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any or respond to any comments. Thank you very much, Dr. Halpern. Are there any questions? Okay, if no questions, let's go ahead and continue with our program. Dr. Shulugo will be introducing. Great, so I have uh, the uh, pleasure of introducing our first, our next speaker, Dr. Joseph Brzezinski, who is the director of the New York City Tuberculosis Control Program. Um, this is both a professional and personal pleasure for me. Um, Dr. Brzezinski and I have been professional colleagues and very good friends for about 25 years, um, working together uh, when I was at Columbia University, uh, both of us as uh, principal investigators in the CDC's Tuberculosis Trials Consortium, um, which is an international research consortium that does phase two and phase three studies in uh, latent and active TB. Um, Dr. Brzezinski is really one of the most talented and important uh, people working in public health in tuberculosis in the United States today. Uh, as I mentioned, is director of the New York City TB Control Program, which is the largest municipal TB control program in the country. Uh, he's a graduate of uh, the University of Louisville School of Medicine and the Harvard School of Public Health, where he received his MPH degree. Uh, he's currently president of the um, what was called the National TB Controllers Association, um, which is the organization of all the public health officials in the United States responsible for tuberculosis. It's now called the National TB Coalition. Is that right? Okay, I got that right. Um, uh, and really is, is recognized nationally and internationally as uh, a leader in uh, public health and in tuberculosis, uh, he's contributed greatly to this field, um, including very recently, I think, really pioneering the use of remote technologies uh, to augment and enhance the ability of health departments to directly observe therapy, uh, and uh, really has one of the most challenging jobs in tuberculosis in the United States, running the program in New York City. Uh, it's something he's done for a long time and does extraordinarily well, and it's really our privilege to have him today with us as a speaker, and he's going to talk to us today about the epidemi epidemiology of TB uh, in our area uh, and beyond, and Joe, it's a pleasure to welcome you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. That was a really nice welcome. I'm glad Dr. Schluger mentioned that he has worked in tuberculosis. He didn't mention that he was also chair of the Tuberculosis Trial Consortium for 10 years. So he's really the leader in TB uh, in the United States. He's not as involved anymore, but he still probably knows more than anybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. I'm, my talk is largely focused on our work in New York City, but I think a lot of it is relevant to your work here in Westchester. So I have no conflict of interest. My talk today will concern tuberculosis epidemiology, in particular our epi in New York City. I'm gonna provide a few clinic updates, clinical updates, um, talk about some new treatment regimens for TB, then TB care and prevention for new arrivals, which has been a very important issue for us this year, other New York City updates, and then talk about resources and opportunities. So before I get into the epidemiology of TB in New York City, probably most people in this room know, but in case anybody doesn't, 
TB is still a huge global public health problem. It is the leading cause of death from an infection in the world. It's more than COVID, it's more than HIV, it's more than malaria. There's about 10 million cases a year. And some forms of drug-resistant TB are very, very difficult to treat. And this isn't getting any better anytime soon. So um, we're gonna continue to see TB as you work here in the medical center, you're gonna see TB. If you go work in another country, you're gonna see TB. It's something very important to know. So th these are our activities. We have a comprehensive program in, in, in the city. We're very lucky to have the support that we do. Uh, we could use some more, but uh, we're, we're happy with, with what we get. And what we do is uh, surveillance is most important. We think we know about every TB case in the city. And that's because the labs report automatically to us. Um, this is not true in most parts of the world. Most parts of the world, 30, 40, 50% of cases are notified to the public health uh, program, often because many of them never get diagnosed. People just walk around with active TB undiagnosed, um, some until they get better, some until they die. Um, and then other places people will go to uh, private providers who don't contact the uh, public health department. So um, we feel like we're lucky. We feel like we know about all the, the cases. That's very important. Clinical care, we have three TB clinics in the city. Um, same as here, we offer free care. Don't ask about immigration. We have great doctors and nurses with a lot of experience. Uh, treatment is free. Any medication anybody needs for TB, we can offer it for free. We can, you can call us uh, about medical consultation if you have a question about how to treat your TB patient. Uh, laboratory testing, we're very lucky to have public health laboratory in the city and at the state. Uh, the Wadsworth TB uh, labs, really the best testing facilities in the world. We're very lucky to have access to that. Case management, every single person that's diagnosed with TB gets a case manager that case manager does the education, tells them about TB, tells them we're gonna, they're gonna go for their treatment, tells them where they're gonna go for their follow-up, asks them who their contacts were. TB is spread through the air. So when somebody has TB, we need to find out who they've been living with or spending a lot of time with so we can test those contacts. Um, we do outbreak detection with whole genome sequencing. Vincent will probably talk about that later. We have conferences. Um, we do a lot of strategic planning. So what do our numbers look like? And um, this is purposefully kind of uh, non-dramatic, but if you listen to what I'm saying, you might feel differently. We had 684 cases last year in, in New York City, 684. That's a 28% increase from the year before. We had 150 more cases last year than we had the year before. That's the greatest increase in over one year that we've seen since the late 1980s. Um, our rate is 7.8 per 100,000, which, so those numbers are alarming, right? It sounds bad. Uh, I was at a conference last week in the Philippines, the numbers are 600 per 100,000. Same if you go to uh, Bangladesh, India, some parts of Africa, very, very, very different uh, picture where there's much higher rates of TB. Um, so in one way, we're lucky. We don't have that much. Most people are not uh, at risk for uh, getting TB, but it's still concerning that our, our cases are going up and our rates are going up. I think you're having the same story here. Um, I think uh, one of the other speakers will mention it later in the day. So 69% of our uh, cases last year were in people of the working age between the ages of 18 and 64. 68% uh, were men, 32% women. If you look at TB cases around the world, there's usually a preponderance of male to female, but that ratio is really unusual, 68% is very unusual. 
probably has to do something with the recent arrivals that have been coming into New York. Um, we've had about 180,000 um, come in the last year, um, largely across the southern border. Um, and uh, by far more single men are coming than single women. Um, and there are some families, of course, but a large number of the people are, are single men. And I think that's why you see that, that number there. Um, our non-US born cases, as the uh, historian, Dr. Halperin told us, uh, uh, there is, uh, it's important for us to know these numbers. For many years, we've realized that people are coming from other countries that have higher rates of TB. In New York City, 89% of our uh, cases are in non-US born. Um, what's important, I think, last year was the rates went up in both the U.S. born and in the non-U.S. born. And if you look at the U.S. born, you see a, a higher uh, rate in pers uh, Black and Hispanic um, New Yorkers. And where are the countries that people are coming from in New York? We have a large population of people who have come to the city from China, and they've been our number one country for a long time. Um, we've worked closely with the Chinese American Medical Society and other groups to try to uh, reach this population, make sure that their service is available, uh, provide education. Other countries, United States, then Ecuador, Bangladesh, Mexico. And then if you look towards the bottom of the list. There are some new countries. Uh, Venezuela is new. We hadn't seen um, cases from people from Venezuela before, and, and Senegal also is, is new. Um, so this reflects part of the numbers of people coming into the city over the last year. Where in New York City? Well, the highest neighborhoods are uh, in West Queens, that's around where Elmhurst Hospital is located and our Corona TB clinic. Um, large number of cases, 108, 106 cases with a rate of 23 per 100,000. It's a very, very uh, diverse neighborhood. Um, many people coming to live there from um, countries that have a lot of TB, uh, India, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan. If you've ever been there, it's a great neighborhood. There's all kinds of... Uh, food from uh, other countries, very, very interesting, um, but they have uh, higher rates of TB. Uh, Flushing um, in Queens also had 36 cases with the rate of 14, and Sunset Park in Brooklyn um, had 19 cases for a rate of 16 per 100,000. Clinical character Characteristics, 81% of our cases had some time of pulmonary involvement. Pulmonary involvement is very important because if there's pulmonary involvement, it usually means that that person could potentially spread TB. So we do a contact investigation around those cases uh, most of the time. Um, and these percentages are, are what we see most of the time, about 20% are extra pulmonary. We had 13 cases of multi-drug resistant TB and one case of extra, uh, uh, extremely drug per, uh, resistant TB last year. Uh, those numbers are up. The It's important for us to think about this. Uh, multi-drug resistant TB is drug uh, TB that's resistant to INH and rifampin. Those are our two main drugs, uh, extremely drug Resistant TB includes re resistance to some of their newer drugs that are very important for us now, such as the quinolones and uh, bedaquilin. For our clinics, we saw 20,000, uh, we had 20,000 patient visits at our clinics last year. That's a 25% increase from the year before. Um, Fort Green in Brooklyn is our busiest clinic, followed by uh, the one in Queens. So uh, I want to talk just a little bit now about uh, some new treatment regimens. As uh, the commissioner mentioned earlier, there is a four-month treatment for active TB. 
This came out of a study from the TBTC. Most TB treatment, the standard treatment is six months. There's now a new four month regimen that consists of isoniazid, rifapentin, moxifloxacin, and pyrazinamide. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and in the MMWR in 2022. So uh, our team put together an implementation plan so that we could use this in our clinics. You know, it's very hard to get anybody to change their ways if they've been treating TB. The TB regimen hasn't changed in about 50 years. So to get a doctor uh, to do something different was a real challenge. But with our, our team here, we did have some experience in using this new four month regimen. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. Um, unfortunately, our experience has not been great. We have had 36 patients who have started this regimen in our clinics. 64% um, had some type of a adverse event side effect. Most of them were uh, minor, grade one or grade two, although a couple had more serious adverse events and a couple had to um, go to the hospital for evaluation. Most common complaints were nausea, vomiting, gastrointestinal issues. So I'm not doing any comparison here. I'll have to say if you you yourself have been treating TB with a standard regimen, you know that that's not a great regimen either. There's a lot of side effects. Um, we have to start and stop that regimen frequently. Uh, we, had, we had hoped we'd found something that would be well tolerated and shorter, but um, we're struggling right now to find which patients will tolerate this regimen. So in our clinics, uh, uh, this is just our experience. We out, out of all those eligible patients, 284, only 40 got started. The reason for that is a lot of our patients get diagnosed in the hospital, get started on the standard treatment regimen. By the time they get to our clinic, they don't want to change. Um, or I say, I, you know, I'm tolerating this so well, well enough. What's, you know, just to save a couple of weeks, I'm not going to do it. And so that's been the biggest, biggest obstacle to the implementation. Nobody in any of the hospitals is starting the four month regimen. Here's treatment of multi-drug resistant TB. This is really remarkable. That's, if you look at the patient's left hand, left hand, that was the daily treatment regimen for MDR TB till about 2018. Plus you had to get a shot every day, an injection. Um, so you can imagine that was not well tolerated, not well received. Um, it was really, really awful. Now we're fortunate we have this new regimen, which you can see in the patient's right hand. That's the BPAL regimen. It's a new regimen, uh, much easier to take, much better tolerated, many fewer pills, and it's only six months. The old regimen was taken for 18 to 24 months. The new regimen's taken for six months. So that's a huge, huge breakthrough. Um, you might hear from uh, Vincent a little bit later that we're worried that we're gonna start to see resistance to this medication, but Aquilin and we'll lose it. But so far in New York City, we haven't. So this has been our experience. Uh, we started slow. You know, again, doctors are very hesitant to change, change anything. But we started slow, we got a few people on it, then five, and then by 2022, we realized this was, there's just no question. This is so much better for the patients. It's so well tolerated um, and our success has been great. Uh, only one patient did not complete treatment with a regimen and everybody that's completed, we haven't had any recurrences, no relapses. So this has been a huge, huge success. And I'll say that this treatment regimen has been rolled out in other countries. Uh, for example, South Africa, where there's a lot of MDR-TB, they've had uh, tremendous su success in having people get access to this treatment. That same for, is true in other countries in Africa. Uh, and now all countries around the world are starting to roll out the BPAL regimen. Um, I, I do want to mention we don't really use BPAL so much anymore. Um, I'm not going to talk about this because my 
time is short, but uh, after that initial study, a follow-up study showed that if you also add moxifloxacin to that BPAL regimen, it's even better. A um, little bit better cure rates and um, probably prevents the development of resistance. So most people are using the BPAL plus moxifloxacin. Um, just to tell you about our work with the Tuberculosis Trials Consortium, we're always looking for new, shorter, better regimens. The first one here is a new treatment for the treatment of uh, a new regimen for the treatment of latent TB infection. We're hoping that six weeks of daily rifapentine will be better than the treatments that we have right now. So that's a randomized controlled trial. We're running it at our clinics, as are many other sites across the United States. The second uh, regimen here, this is for the treatment of active TB. So like I said a few minutes ago, our standard regimen, some people call it ripe, it's not great. It's six months and it's not that well tolerated. So we're hoping we can find two new regimens that are shorter and better tolerated. One of the regimens in the trial is four months of bedaquiline with patominid, uh, no, sorry, bedaquiline moxifloxacin pyrazinamide with delaminid or bedaquiline moxifloxacin pyrazinamide with rif rifibutin. Um, so that's uh, undergoing now, uh, underway now. Um, we're just starting to enroll patients. So um, we did have 180,000 people come to New York um, in this past year. There's really no coordination of, of clinical care or medical care before coming. Um, and uh, at this point, um, uh, we're running out of room. Um, so there's been a lot of changes in the, in the policies uh, about where people can live and how long they can live. Um, it, it's very complicated. Some people from some countries can apply for uh, parole for temporary status. Uh, those people uh, are asked to get a quantifuron test for TB. Um, we have tried our best to go to some of the shelters and do TB testing. We have found some cases but with 180,000 people, it's um, just been hard to get to everybody. Um, our colleagues, I think some of our colleagues here work at Metropolitan Has Hospital. I know a couple of weeks ago, the uh, wards were filled with people who had uh, screened positive for TB and had abnormal x-rays. Um, that's what happens when you start looking for TB, even though a lot of those people were not very sick you could see something on the x-ray. And so then if they're living in a shelter, we have to bring them into a hospital to do the workup to make sure that they're not uh, infectious. And if they need treatment, they can start on treatment. Um, I won't go into all this, but there are a lot of housing sites across the city. Many different agencies are running the sites. It's kind of confusing because H&H &H is running some of them. Uh, the Department of uh, Homeless Services is running some of them. Housing Preservation is running some of them. Um, there's not always great uh, communication. Uh, things have gotten better, I would say, in the last six months. There's now an arrival center. So people coming in to Port Authority go to the arrival center where they're given services, they're told where they're gonna live, they're given a connection to legal services, um, they're given information about where they can get healthcare, immunizations. Um, they're asked a screening question about TB, but nobody ever says that they have a cough and, and fever and weight loss. Um, but, you know, we're trying. Um, so that's all I'll say with that. Should I click something? Okay. Okay. Um, so the, the health department did put out a dear colleague letter. As you can see, I mean, people coming to the city have all kinds of concerns. Uh, TB is sure probably not in the top 10, um, um, but uh, uh, issues around health insurance, um, legal services, housing, finding food, applying for jobs. Um, we have tried to work in some of our services for TB screening, but it's it's a lot of work. We're doing it with a lot of people who are helping us, um, but it's it's really a huge task. So 
I think I'm going to just kind of skip over this. I will just say again, for all of our TB services, we cannot do it on, on our own. We're so glad to work with our colleagues at h, h at Bellevue and Metropolitan and Elmhurst Hospital, all the federally qualified health centers um, that are helping us do some of the screening and then um, the clinical care for people who have are suspected to have TB or who are diagnosed with active TB. Um, so I just wanted to talk about a few more things. Um, one is uh, concerns TB and isolation. Um, this has been very uh, an interest to me for some time, um, and I feel like I'm, uh, you know, somewhere way out in left field because not many other people were seem to be talking about it. Um, However, there have been recently, the WHO in 2018 um, provided some guidance on how long people should be kept in isolation once they're diagnosed from TB. I'll say if you look at this, um, some, somewhere to some direction in which way you should go about thinking about this, but it's really not clear. Um, in the United States, we have no guidelines on how and when people should be discharged from isolation when they have TB. If you're in the hospital, while you're hospitalized, there are clear guidelines. You should have, you should, it, basically if you're diagnosed with TB, you should stay in isolation while you're in the hospital, unless for some reason, you, you know, you're, you, you have to have some surgery after your second month that you're in the hospital or something. For the most part, you're going to stay in isolation while you're in the hospital until you're smear negative, and there's no chance you have TB. But what, how fast should people be released from the hospital to go back to work, to go back um, and do anything else? And there was no, there's no guidelines on this. So, um, um, I, and I've heard, I hear in my clinic, people tell me, oh, it was so awful being in isolation. Um, you, you know, what we do know is that people who are in isolation for long periods of time get depression, uh, feel stigmatized, um, lose money because they can't go back to work. So we started thinking, you know, what 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 are we doing? Does this make any sense? And um, so my work in this started about three years ago. We did a survey through the National TB Coalition of America asking programs around the country, what do you do when somebody's diagnosed with TB and they want to go home? You know, they're in isolation in the hospital and you want them to go home or um, they want to go back to work or whatever the case may be. It, the interesting part of this was it was all over the map. Everybody was doing something different in all different parts of the country. And so that just doesn't make any sense. How can... Uh, the, re, the, the response to that situation be so different all around the country. So I have been part of a national guidelines development group um, trying to get some uh, better, clearer guidance for people um, on, on when they can come out of the hospital um, and go back home and go back to work. Uh, we're hoping that that will be published soon in clinical infectious diseases. We've submitted it there. We hope it's gonna get published. And uh, I think that'll help everybody um, have a better understanding. Um, if you speak to patient advocates, people who have had TB, one of the first things they'll tell you about is that time that they were in the hospital while they were in isolation and nobody would come to visit them and the nurses were afraid to walk in the room and the doctors were afraid to walk in the room. Um, you know, so uh, hopefully we'll get a better um, position on this. Uh, TB isolation uh, survey. One more thing we're doing, and this has really s shocked me, and that is nobody's ever studied this. Um, you know, it's something that's been a core of our TB programs in the United States, and nobody's ever studied it. So we are doing a survey of our patients after they've been in isolation and asking them some questions, trying to do some qualitative research. Uh, this is our detailing toolkit. This is for uh, uh, testing and treating for latent TB infection. We developed this toolkit, went around to private primary care providers and 
um, federally qualified health centers around the city, asking them, how do you test for TB? Who do you test? If you do find a positive test, what do you do next to me? Um, and, uh, you know, it's surprising. A lot of people didn't know the basics really about testing for TB or treatment. So um, we went back six weeks later and found that uh, the providers had retained a lot of the information. And so hopefully we improve practices. Um, we do have a coalition for TB free New York City, but we, you don't have to be from New York City. Any of you out in the audience that wanna join our meetings, we welcome you. Please uh, let me know if you would like to join. Um, I'm going to skip that. I will say we won some awards this year. Uh, we do have this clinical policies and program manual. Um, this is kind of the um, nuts and bolts of running a TB program. If anybody would like uh, one of these, we have some more available. So just let me know. We can provide them to you. It's also available online at our, on our website. There's the information about the coalition. There's our clinics, our T World TB Day events happening right now. We ask uh, our partners in the community to think about TB, particularly if somebody's a new arrival to the city, ask them about symptoms for TB. If they don't have symptoms, test them for latent TB. If the test is positive, take an X-ray so we can identify TB quickly. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. I'd love to take questions if there's any time. Thank you. Have any uh, questions in the audience? A minute or two for some questions. We have two mics, unless you wanna yell out your question, Dr. Galeeper. What? Oh, this is one of the two, no problem. You can no, it's for the gym people, though. So I, I know that in New York City, you know, you know, we have our hands full, but there are a, a decent number of cities that keep getting busloads of, of people from south of the border coming. And it just seems to me that, you know, we all have the same problems in terms of, of, uh, of, of tuberculosis coming in. So, I mean, if nothing else, it should be a uniting factor. Okay, uh, you know, all of the cities that are getting the busloads of, of people coming in and, and it should be for, for health purposes and it should be for, you know, uh, just political clout as, as what should be done in terms of getting finances, you know, for your, you know, for your efforts and the efforts in, in all the other cities. I mean, this is not a joke what, you, what you've been speaking about. Yeah, so I'll just say um, it's, a, it's a loaded political question and I don't have the answer for it. I, I want to make clear most people coming here do not have TB. Um, we just we find higher rates in people coming from some countries that have more of a TB burden or don't have a good public health infrastructure. And we want to make sure to identify it before it becomes a public health problem. Um, I think New York City has done a pretty good job now of uh, offering services, health care, uh, immunization services, legal services to people when they arrive. But, you know, there's a political reality that the city's also trying to, um, uh, uh, well, let's just say it's difficult. Um, um, you know, there's a, I think this, the leaders in the city realize there's a limit to how much uh, housing we have, how, mu how much resources we have. And um, uh, so I think they're walking a, a fine line now of making it a, a good service to everybody who comes in, but not um, making it, uh, we're not encouraging people to come here. You know, this is the place to come, um, which I think was part of an issue at the very beginning um, with uh, uh, abundant housing services. Word got out on social media, kind of fed into the uh, large number of people coming into, into the city at the beginning. We have some questions from the chat. We don't have time for all of them, but I'll pick one question to ask from the chat. For coronavirus positive and chest x-ray fibrosis, 
and no symptoms, how do you decide on treatment right off versus waiting for cultures and repeating the chest X-ray and give latent regimen? So the, yeah, the question is about quantifuron positive with some fibrosis on the X-ray. So uh, I will say you can be fooled. Somebody can tell you they have no symptoms. They might not have any symptoms, but have fibrosis on the X-ray. Most patients in that situation, we would collect sputum to make sure that they don't have active TB and wait for the cultures to uh, be finalized. Then when they're negative, we treat for latent TB infection. Um, uh, an option there, if you really wanted to, you could collect the sputum and start four drugs. If it turns out to be active TB, uh, great. You've got the patient on treatment already. Um, and then if the cultures are negative, you can shorten the treatment and you'll have completed the treatment for active TB. I would say for most of the time, most situations, you just want to be patient. TB is a slow disease. It's a slow growing disease. It's a slow spreading disease. So if you see someone who's asymptomatic and uh, some fibrosis on the x-ray, most of the time our clinicians will do the quantiferon test, um, uh, quantiferon test first, then the fibrosis, collect the cultures and wait it out, and then start the latent TB treatment after the culture results come in. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Davin Hatzengate is the medical director of the Bureau of Tuberculosis Control at New York State Department of Health. He received his medical degree from Tufts University School of Medicine. He completed his residency training in internal medicine at Bellevue and NYU and worked as an academic hospitalist before transitioning into hospice and palliative medicine. He then completed a master's of public health at the Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. Dr. Hatzengate joined the Bureau of TB for New York State DOH in 2022. Dr. Hatzengate. Perfect. Hey, everybody hear me? Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, my talk today is focused on uh, non-TB specialist providers, um, hopefully also interesting for students, residents, and hopefully everybody. Uh, there is a lot of overlap in between what I'm saying and what other speakers have said, uh, which I hope is okay, because if you want people to remember things, repetition is important, as is repetition. So why does this matter to you as a non-TB specialist? Uh, if you are a generalist who has not been in practice for a lot of years, it's very possible that you might never have seen TB. Uh, it matters because TB is both more common and more complicated than a lot of people anticipate. It is more common in the sense that although the United States is a low incidence country, we still have roughly one in four humans on the, play, on the face of the planet currently harbor TB, living TB in their bodies, despite the multi-decade overall uh, trend towards less incidence. Also, we have, as Dr. Brzezinski showed, an increase in incidence over the last few years since the pandemic. So that's been noticed uh, in the United States and in New York City, uh, I'm sorry, and in New York State as well. We usually see nearly 200 cases of active TB disease in New York State, and that's outside of New York City, which is its own jurisdiction. Last year, in fact, we had more than 200 cases. TB is also more complicated uh, because we're not even dealing with just mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, what we call TB is actually part of uh, a complex of related mycobacteria that can produce similar disease, but have slight differences and sometimes have different drug susceptibilities. We usually see TB as a pulmonary or laryngeal disease, 
but it can present anywhere in the body uh, with varying degrees of infectiousness for other people and necessitating varying treatment approaches. Further complication is that other mycobacteria, non-tuberculous mycobacteria can also infect patients, uh, which complicates the clinical picture. And you can even have co-infection with non-tuberculous mycobacteria and TB at the same time. So I will give you a warning that my uh, beginning slides are mostly bad news. And here is some more with the clinical aspects of managing TB. As has been mentioned, TB is very slow to grow, very slow to metabolize. And that changes aspects of TB's presentation and clinical treatment. Clinically, TB tends to look almost like a slow motion train wreck. And that's true for the individual patient suffering from the disease and from the community that may be affected. For this reason, it really needs a lot of close follow-up throughout the entire case. When people are first infected with TB, we usually see what we call latent tuberculosis infection. The body's defenses are able to sort of reach a stalemate with TB. And for 90% of people, that's the way it stays, really, for the rest of their lives. They don't have symptoms, they, uh, they are not infectious, but they're carrying around TB. 10% of people will eventually go on to have clinical TB disease, but that can take months, years, decades. Once people are being treated for TB, that treatment can last months, sometimes even for years. It requires multiple drugs to prevent resistance and to achieve a good clinical outcome. And unfortunately, these are relatively toxic drugs a lot of the time. They have a lot of potential adverse reactions, which vary, of course, by the medication being used and oftentimes are seen after the patient has tolerated the regimen for weeks or months even. Confirming the diagnosis of TB and checking the drug susceptibilities will also take longer than almost all the infectious conditions that you commonly manage. This process can take weeks and sometimes more than a month, although stay tuned because we have, uh, we have an exciting uh, discussion from Wadsworth Lab coming up. Treating TB is a slow and complicated process, and there is always the threat of drug resistance. So our standard treatment, as mentioned, is usually what they call the RIPE regimen, rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and sambutol. These are really four of the drugs we have that are most available, the most well-studied, the most efficacious, and the most well-tolerated. So we try to use them even though they're the best of our imperfect options. We do have other drugs available when necessary, but skipping ahead, it's a really good idea to talk to your county when you need those drugs. We have good news and bad news when it comes to other drugs with TB. The good definitely being the BPOL regimen or the BPOLM regimen that Dr. Brzezinski went into. This is really a game changer. It's only three drugs. Uh, it's all oral, usually can be completed in six to nine months, usually much, well, much better tolerated than, than a lot of our other drugs. The bad news is that we still sometimes have to use other older medications to treat TB, usually in circumstances where the patient's TB is broadly resistant to multiple medications or they're unable to tolerate the regimen that we wanna use. The older regimens that we use tend to be less available medications. They tend to be more toxic. They tend to demand a longer course. They tend to be more expensive and oftentimes they involve daily injections as well. The nightmare scenario that we want to avoid is somebody who has multi-drug resistant TB and are infectious and out in the community. It gives me the willies just thinking about it. The risk of that nightmare scenario is heightened, unfortunately, by the downsides of our recent success in TB public health. Recent decades, as uh, Dr. Brzezinski showed, have really shown an overall steady and dramatic decline in TB incidence in New York State. And the consequence of that is that we've seen a steady loss of institutional knowledge and personal experience with all things TB. For those of you who've been in practice for many decades, you probably remember a time when there was more TB to be dealt with. And for those of you who are more early in your careers, you probably haven't seen a lot of TB at all. Even worse, as Dr. Brzezinski also mentioned, we've seen increases in incidents since the beginning of the COVID pandemic. So right now today, the situation we're dealing with is a simultaneous increase in incidence rates of TB along with a loss of knowledge and familiarity with how to handle it. And the truth is it's, it's not realistic to expect you as a generalist provider to maintain expertise in our rare complicated niche disease. 
And uh, we're very grateful that everybody is coming here, but this afternoon is not enough to bring you fully up to speed. Fortunately, however, this is the end of my scary bad news portion because you are not alone. There are multiple support systems in place, both clinical and administrative. The first and most important resource you have is your County Department of Health. Uh, beyond that, we have the New York State Department of Health as another layer of support, that's us. And when needed, there are regional and national sources of expertise for expert clinical guidance. Uh, I will tell you that I'm in my second year in TB and I absolutely have re relied on these sources, also including New York City, uh, for many, many times so far and I will continue to utilize them in the future. Uh, we remember all the, the previous kind of scary bad news slides. Well, all of those are reminders of the necessity, really the necessity of collaboration and coordination, communication between your various support systems, especially your County Department of Health. The County Department of Health here in New York State has responsibility for case management of all the TB cases in the county and ensuring that adequate care is provided to all of those cases. So that can take the form of uh, direct clinical care and directly observed therapy for patients who are not having their TB primarily managed by their primary provider. DOT, as mentioned, directly observed therapy is actually very, very important because remember, we're talking about a disease that requires treatment with daily handfuls of pills for months at a time that are toxic often and also, people tend to feel better relatively early on in their clinical course. So we need to get them to continue to take these medicine for a long period of time. And directly observed therapy is really the best tool evidence supported to, to bring about a good outcome. There's also the scenario where uh, a patient and a primary care provider elect to manage the, the TB course uh, of, the treat, of the patient without directly involving the County Department of Health in that. In that circumstance, the County Department of Health still maintains case monitoring and direct active regular communications with the patient. The County Department of Health offers directly observed therapy. And in the circumstance where the patient and the private provider don't want the county to help with DOT, the county through continued uh, communications with the patient, if they develop concern that a patient might be missing doses, the county will contact the primary uh, care provider to discuss the case. And again, that's, that's typically a minority of cases here in New York State. So your county Department of Health is really a comprehensive support resource, but wait, there's more because I couldn't even fit it on one slide. The county coordinates with providers which are outside the county. When you have patients coming and going from the county, this is a big deal we will talk about in the upcoming slide. The county also receives mandated reports of suspicion of TB. Please don't wait until you have a confirmed case to alert the county. There are also contact investigations, which we will talk about upcoming, uh, to find other people who may have been exposed to the index patient before they uh, were rendered non-infectious through their treatment. The county can also help coordinate with other jurisdictions when contacts extend beyond the county. It's relatively rare that anybody spends their entire lives in one county these days. A big one is that the County Department of Health uh, is a clinical resource for you. It really should be your first call for any questions, any clinical complications that you may have as a provider or as a local institution. Communicating guidance updates also comes from the county because again, we're not expecting you to be up to date on the latest all the time. Your county will be able to update you as needed. Uh, and I would imagine most people in the audience practice here downstate uh, where Really, this is the lion's share of our TB burden in the state, and the county departments of health tend to be experienced and knowledgeable. Uh, and I will say that the Westchester County Department of Health is really a top tier program. Uh, I think Dr. Hewlett and Dr. Amler may be too classy to brag about it, but I am not. Uh, if you are here in Westchester County, you really have a gem that you can turn to for, for a lot of help. For further support beyond the county, you have us, the New York State Department of Health. What we do is track TB cases across New York State, again, outside of New York City. We, when there are patients who are transferred in and out of counties, uh, the state forwards the interjurisdictional notification and facilitates communications as needed. We forward those interjurisdictional inter notifications from the county when there are contact investigations extending outside the county, and we help with questions there as needed too. 
We're also available to provide assistance to counties, both in terms of planning contact investigations, uh, which are gonna come in an upcoming slide, but just to say that there's a lot of factors that go into contact investigations. How infectious is the patient? What were the circumstances where the contact was near the patient? Exactly how close were they to the patient? Exactly how long was the exposure? What were the environmental factors in the setting? Uh, th there's a lot to take into account. We also help with managing ch challenging clinical situations. And that's really especially for counties that don't see a lot of TB, uh, that are low incidence counties, um, tends to be more upstate. I'm not sure if anybody in the audience is from those upstate counties today. And when needed for truly complicated and unique situations, we can help uh, connect providers in the county to regional and national uh, resources as needed. Our regional authority is our CDC designated center of excellence, the Global Tuberculosis Institute in, at Rutgers. And I will tell you that I have had many very positive, very helpful, critical support from them, and I, I continue to rely on them. And then also just say the, uh, the New York State Public Health Law does support TB control. There are multiple areas that specifically are dedicated to, D to TB. And no, I will not be commenting on the interpretation of those laws without a member of the legal department next to me. But I will comment on communication and collaboration, really the meat of my talk here. We always need updates connecting our local providers, that be you, with your county department of health, with us at the state level, and even with other jurisdictions beyond. So remember my slides about how treating TB is both slow and complicated. Uh, making sure that everybody is on the same page as the case evolves is really critical. Remember, TB is a reportable condition. Providers and labs are mandated to notify the county for suspected cases. Again, please don't wait until you have confirmation of the diagnosis. Providers, labs, hospitals report cases to the County Department of Health, who reports them to us, and we eventually report to the CDC. This communication and collaboration really benefits everyone, uh, makes everybody aware of clinical progression or regression, drug resistance, or uh, developments with exposed contacts to your case. Uh, this really, honestly, is not just the heavy hand of state government. This is of concrete benefit to you. Uh, your county department of health can directly help with situations like drug shortages or gaps in treatment, things that come up not infrequently in TB. And so I'd like to proceed next into some examples of the benefits. So first of all, facilitating transfers of care. Remember, uh, TB, TB treatment is multiple drugs, multiple months. TB needs smooth transfers from hospital setting, skilled nursing facility to home, maybe other places outside of New York. Remember, this is not uh, a, a disease that you can treat with a 10 day course of something and you only have to have that kind of follow up when somebody's leaving the hospital. This is months of treatment and everybody has to be on the same side to, to on the same page to prevent disruptions in treatment. Interruptions in treatment can result in the patient becoming infectious again as their disease burden grows or even developing new resistance. Uh, this can occur in, patient, in situations like patients presenting to a new hospital, a new medical office, uh, entering or leaving the correctional system here in New York, uh, moving to or moving from other counties, other states, even other countries. And in those situations, the county Department of Health handles the coordination between the sending and receiving treatment teams. Uh, we forward the, uh, the interjurisdictional notifications and support the counties however we can. These transfers of care are primarily done by the county, again, with state support from us. Uh, and it's important in every case, really, but it's especially important for cases of drug-resistant TB. Again, remember our nightmare scenario. Uh, a care disruption in a transfer of a patient leads to new drug resistance or the patient becoming infectious again with their drug-resistant TB, that is a zero out of five star situation, would not recommend. So contact investigations. Remember, TB is not measles, TB is not COVID. This is a slow motion train wreck that is happening. A single TB case really is the tip of the iceberg when it comes to TB. Remember, only 10% of people infected with TB will eventually go on to have disease, and that can take place months, years, decades later. The clinical spread of TB in communities can therefore take many years. And for all of these reasons, we cannot rely on passive case reporting. We just can't. We need to have contact investigations to, to critically 
break the, ch the chain of infection within the community. And it's worth noting that when you can identify people who have mere infection with TB and not TB disease, treating them is much, much easier than treating people with TB disease. People who have infection are typically not infectious. They are not symptomatic. They have uh, the chance to be treated with fewer drugs for less time. It is much better for everybody if they can be treated at that point. The context of index patients with TB can be in the home, in the workplace, in social and community settings. This is a complicated process, really. Every contact investigation needs an individual assessment. They get complicated pretty quickly. And so it's a good thing for you that your county department of health takes an active role in helping you through the whole thing. Uh, we, uh, I just also would like to note, we are very lucky here in New York state, we have the Wadsworth lab. More than any other state, we really can rapidly trace the spread of specific strains of TB. It is a, a really powerful advantage and it's getting better all the time. Stay tuned for Dr. Escuye's lecture coming up next. And actually for a specific example of the benefits of contact uh, investigations, this actually happened quite recently here in New York state. We had a county that had an outbreak of TB. It was not drug resistant, thank goodness. But people who had this strain uh, presented with a much faster clinical progression than we not normally see. They were presenting for initial evaluation, oftentimes with more advanced clinical disease. Fortunately, the county undertook a heroic contact investigation, which was facilitated by the molecular ID provided by the Wadsworth lab, which led to more rapid evaluation of the contacts and of infected people, reduced the likelihood of people presenting with severe disease or even dying of their TB, and is stopping the, the spread of the outbreak. This uh, contact investigation is a great example of the benefits of collaborating in terms of improving the accuracy of your diagnosis and the efficacy of your treatment. Close collaboration with your county gives you and your patient the best chances of a good clinical outcome. Uh, with the updated sputum samples, they can both confirm the original diagnosis and even more importantly, uh, give updated information on the drug susceptibility of the patient's TB. This is a really big deal, actually. Uh, remember, TB is slow growing and is deviously industrious in the development of resistance. It's relatively easy for TB to develop new resistance to a single drug when we don't realize that they're already resistant to the other drug or drugs they're being treated with. And uh, of course, this is even worse if the patient becomes infectious with their drug resistant TB. Always remember the nightmare. Some red flags that you should be aware of as clinicians. Uh, if you become aware of a patient who has started on TB disease treatment with only one or two drugs, or somebody who is failing their treatment and clinically worsening while on treatment and they get one single drug added to their failing regimen, these are red flags. Please reach out to the county immediately if you see anything like this. The best way to ensure your treatment is efficacious is to always keep your county current on the details of your case. And how is it that the county is able to uh, provide such benefit? Well, we have our secret ally, not so secret, in the Wadsworth Mycobacterial Lab. Our state lab really is a national leader. Uh, it just needs samples from you in order to help you. Uh, remember, Wadsworth has specialized capabilities far beyond those uh, available in your local uh, hospital lab or commercial lab. Stay tuned for Dr. Escuye, very exciting stuff coming up. Uh, new techniques have really sped up the process of molecular drug resistance testing. It's really quite remarkable. For every patient for whom you're seriously entertaining the diagnosis of pulmonary TB, a raw sputum sample should be sent to the Wadsworth lab and your county can help you with that process. Uh, and if needed for clinical monitoring and ongoing uh, case follow-up, Wadsworth will also accept an additional sputum sample per patient monthly. So what about future developments? Well, again, your county Department of Health can help. If you're not already a TB specialist, kind of by definition, you have got a lot of other stuff on your plate. We can't expect you, and really you shouldn't expect yourself to keep current on all the latest in, in the TB world. TB care is always evolving. Ongoing communications with your county will ensure that you don't miss anything big. A couple of quick examples, the BPOL regimen as mentioned for uh, drug resistant TB, the new short course HPMZ regimen for selected patients. Dr. Schluger is gonna tell us about that. 
And uh, the example of patients who have diabetes and also go on to have TB. Uh, if you're a generalist, you're certainly aware of diabetes in our society. And I'm looking forward to hearing Dr. Hewlett's remarks on, on that subject. Okay, so we're in the home stretch now. Uh, what should you remember from this talk? Four things. Number one, uh, to clinically manage patients with TB, you need to have patients, you need to have ongoing regular attention and reassessment to your patients again, potentially for many months. And you need to have awareness of the latest research and guidelines for treating TB. Second, clinical TB management doesn't stop with just the patient. We need to have a perspective that includes their contacts and their community. Thirdly, your main, your first call, but not necessarily your only option is, for TB support is your county department of health. And again, that is especially the case here in Westchester County, really excellent program here. Finally, there are available resources to help you with pretty much every aspect of TB investigations and, and TB management. Uh, all of those research, resources will work better for you the more that you have active and ongoing communication and collaboration. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I welcome any uh, questions or concerns and I have some contact information up here for you as well. Thank you. Do you have any questions in the audience? Is it time for a question or a question? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Take this off. If you want to welcome Dr. Escrier, who's been mentioned in just about every talk so far. He's an important man. You have to be nice to him because he has all your specimens for all your patients. Um, he's a direct, that's because he's a director of the mycobacteriology lab at Wadsworth, New York State Department of Health Lab. He's also a laboratory consultant for the Global uh, Tuberculosis Institute, which is one of the centers for uh, uh, excellence funded by the CDC that provides training, education, and medical consultation to healthcare professionals like this audience to make sure we do the right thing by our uh, TB patients. His main interests are in rapid TB diagnostics, including whole genome sequencing and targeted next-gen sequencing. So thank you very much for joining us. Right here? Yeah. Or you can use one of these. You're going to record with the arrows? That's okay. Yeah. yeah. Right as forward. So, right as yeah. Okay. That's okay. Right. okay. Good. Good. Let me just hide this up here. Okay. okay. All yours. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, thank you very much for the invite in, invitation. Um, listening. Uh, uh, you know, to, to, to Joe and Devin talk, uh, make me realize that probably I should have prepared a second talk because I'm not really gonna cover everything uh, that maybe we should cover, but it's, uh, that's, that's the nature of the beast where you have 30 minutes, uh, I decided to focus on one particular topic. So we, uh, we are the Wadsworth Center uh, and um, the reference lab for New York State which means that every, I would say, almost every single case of TB is going to come to our lab one way or the other, whether it's a clinical specimen or a culture for labs who have the capacity to grow TB and want to send it to us for further characterization. And uh, we do a broad range uh, of testing, as uh, David mentioned. Uh, we do detection of TB, and we also do a very important part of the testing, which is uh, drug susceptibility testing. And this is this part I'm going to focus on today. Um, and for the rest of my talk, I will try to uh, illustrate the, the very profound impact that the new DNA sequencing technology had on uh, TB diagnostic, particularly uh, uh, in uh, the domain of drug susceptibility. 
So, this on this slide is a conventional drug susceptibility testing. We call it also phenotypic DST. We call it a culture-based DST. So the principle is pretty much the same. Whatever method you use, you grow the organism in the presence of the drug. And if the organism grows, it's resistant. If the organism doesn't grow, it's susceptible. So you can use critical concentration, one or two sometimes, like we do in the midget system or on agar proportion, or you can do a, a broad range of concentration uh, like we do uh, with uh, the assay on the, in the middle here, uh, which is uh, the broad macrodivision assay to determine what we call MIC, minimal inhibitory concentration. But the common theme for all these methods are they are relying on the ability of the isolate to grow in culture. And it was already mentioned that TB is a very, very slow grower. It's a very fastidious organism. Uh, and it can take a long time to give you the results that you uh, want. Uh, weeks sometimes, months sometimes, and sometimes never. Sometimes the isolate decide to quit growing and whatever you try to do, it will not cooperate. So because of this, and because it takes a lot of time, in the meantime, you have physicians who are trying to treat the patient and put this patient in the most appropriate regimen and pretty much are navigating in, in, uh, in the dark. Uh, people have turned to uh, another class of method, what we call the molecular methods. Those are generally faster methods that you're going to plug a little bit upstream in the process. And although sometimes they won't give you the whole picture, they would give you important information that would help the physician to be on the right track uh, to treat the patient. So why is TB amenable to this type of approach, particularly regarding drug susceptibility testing? Well, for TB, many drug resistance genes have been identified. I would argue that most of them have been. There might be some more obscure mechanism of resistance yet to be uh, found, but the main genes have been, uh, are known. And very often, resistance to drugs is due to the presence of mutation in one of these genes or several of these genes. So if you develop methods that will be able to either detect or identify this specific mutation in the target genes, you'll be able to predict with a pretty high confidence uh, the uh, susceptibility or the resistance to the organism to particular drugs. So those molecular methods fall into two main categories. You have what we call the PCR hybridization or pro-base assay. Probably many of you have heard about the gene expert. That's uh, one perfect example of a PCR hybridization assay. Gene expert detects the presence of MTB DNA in the specimen. And in addition, he also detects the presence of mutation in a specific region of the gene RPOB that uh, confer resistance to rifampin. We also have line probe assays, but they're not really uh, very used in, the, in, in this country. And then the second class of method uh, is DNA sequencing. And the DNA sequencing, as opposed to the PCR hybridization assay, not only is going to detect mutation, but it's going to tell you exactly what mutation is present. So you have different methods. You have Sanger sequencing, Paro sequencing. There are older methodologies that are less and less used uh, in the labs. And then you have the newer uh, the DNA sequencing technologies that you can apply either to perform what we call whole genome sequencing, which means that you literally sequence the entire genome of the organism and you basically look to you know, whatever you want to look for, or you can decide to focus on a smaller set of genes. For example, you can decide to pick the most important gene that have been described to be involved in resistance, and then you have what we call targeted next generation sequencing. And today I'm going to talk about those two uh, last assay, whole genome sequencing that we have been performing in our lab for quite a few years now, and our most recent assay, which is a targeted next, a targeted next generation sequencing. Okay, general definition, what is next generation sequencing? Um, next, gen next generation sequencing, or NGS, is a technology uh, that is used to determine sequence of DNA or RNA. It has been introduced in 2005, and it was initially called massively parallel sequencing. Okay? 
which means that as opposed to the older DNA sequencing method where you had to sequence one DNA fragment after the other, with this new method, you can sequence in parallel a huge amount of different sequences, okay? So you can generate a, a, a large, large amount of sequence information. And down the road, you're gonna need, of course, some IT help to analyze all of this. You can do it with the naked eyes. And this is what we call uh, the bioinformatics uh, pipelines that I will uh, mention uh, later in the talk. So you have two main players that I've described here uh, in the field. You have Illumina and uh, the other uh, main player is uh, what we call Oxford Nanopore uh, technology. It's completely different ne uh, technologies, but at the end of the day, same kind of results with this massive amount of, of sequencing. Okay, let's start with the whole genome sequence, uh, which is our really flagship assay. So, in 2014, uh, Wedworth Center brought in-house next generation sequencing. We started with Illumina. And it was mostly brought to, for outbreak investigation, foodborne disease, uh, Legionella. So basically what you are doing, you are sequencing strain, comparing the, the, the different isolates and try to figure out what was going on uh, in the transmission and, and where the source of uh, contamination was. You can also do this with TB. David mentioned it. I won't be uh, talking about much uh, today about it, but we do it uh, on a regular uh, basis. You can use whole genome sequence for the same thing uh, to track outbreak, contact investigation, and see the transmission of a TB strain uh, within the community. But we wanted to have a different approach for whole genome sequence uh, with, with TB. And we started to think that what if we can use it not only for outbreak investigation, but also as a clinical test, okay? And we wanted to uh, use whole genome sequence as soon as possible in our testing algorithm to impact as early as possible the patient treatment. Uh, whole genome sequence, as I say, the sky is the limit, so it was expanding our molecular resistance prediction. And we were be able to provide more comprehensive results and provide also a best turnaround time possible. So we are back in this big journey, and I won't get into the details, but we started really uh, the development in 2015. It took a year. In 2016, uh, the uh, old genome sequencing assay was approved by uh, CLEP, which is our uh, you know, a regulatory agency at New York. Uh, so after approval, we were able to start using the whole genome sequence on New York State patient. And we uh, went along uh, since 2016. In 2018, there was a major change uh, in the algorithm, and I would mention it uh, a, a little later, where we uh, decided to drop some of our phenotypic testing uh, and, and stick with the results uh, of, of all genome sequence. And now we're in 2024, and we have sequence uh, just for New York. Uh, pretty much we passed the cap recently of 5,000 isolates. So we have right now in our data bank, database, 5,000 New York State isolate, fully sequenced, and an extra 1,000 isolates from other states and other things. So it's a, it's a very, it's a, for us, it's a real gold mine, and we can dig into this large database to, 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 to move forward and probably to, to improve and develop new assays. That is a very simplistic view of what the whole genome sequence is. So the starting material, and it's one of the, I shouldn't say downside of the, of the whole genome sequence, but it's one of the limitation of the whole genome sequence. So far, the starting material has to be culture material. Uh, doesn't work on primary specimen. Um, so what you do, you just extract the DNA. We do a little bit of upstream preparation, called library preparation. You put this on the cell, put it in the sequencer. The sequencer run is run and basically uh, give you a huge file of raw sequences. So this file, as I said, you can be, uh, uh, you won't be able to analyze it with a naked eye. You need to run it through a bioinformatic pipeline. And this bioinformatic pipeline is gonna basically look for what you are interested in, basically format all this data, basically taking all the pieces of the puzzle and put them back together and generate a raw report. 
That's a report we are looking at to do QC, to look if everything is fine. But the data are also directly imported in our limb system. And the limb system is going to generate automatically the report that you submitter will see. So the report we see is a little more comprehensive than the reports you see. OK, so this is a pipeline. I won't get into much, much detail uh, because for the sake of time. But the pipeline uh, consists in, in, in several, several programs that do different tasks. Uh, on the left here, you have a, a, a program that's going to identify the species within the MTB complex. David mentioned that TB complex has several species. And, and it's very interesting because, Joe, when you said that you had more cases in, from Senegal, uh, we recently saw an increase in Mycobacterium africanum in, in our uh, species. And Mycobacterium africanum is typically a, a strain that you only find uh, in... Is it me? <laughs> no, it's off. Okay. All right. So the second, the second program is more like uh, genotyping for epidemiology purpose. I won't get into this. This one uh, on the left, number four, is for phylogeny. So we are able also to tell you what lineage the strains uh, are belonging to. You know, uh, TB has several lineage. One, two, uh, I think there is a tenth one that was recently described. Why is it important? Well, it is important for us sometimes because some lineage behave differently when it comes to drug susceptibility results. And it has been shown for some drugs that some lineage have a natural resistance, even without mutation. So that can explain sometimes when you get a bizarre results with no mutation, we always look at the lineage uh, to see if it makes sense. That's true for pyrazinamide, for example, and pretermanib recently. Lineage one is a, is a big offender you show an elevated uh, resistance to these two drugs. Um, and of course, the most important for us is this uh, part of the pipeline, which is going to predict the drug resistance or drug susceptibility. So how do we do this? The pipeline is basically going to look at the sequence of uh, 14 target genes okay, that cover nine, nine drugs. Uh, and it's going to compare the sequence to the uh, sequence of the same gene in what we call a reference strain that is completely susceptible. Okay. And it's going to tell us every time you see a difference between the target gene of the strain that we study and the target genes of the reference strain. And it's going to look, you know, so it's going to give you the whole list of, of mutation. And with this, this mutation, it's going to look for what we call the high confidence mutation. And what is a high confidence mutation? It's just a mutation that we know when it's present in one of these genes can predict with very high confidence resistance. So if we find one of these mutations or more of these mutations, we can pretty much tell you with certainty that this drug is probably off the table. OK? Uh, this is an evolving list, of course. As the knowledge evolves, the targets evolve, the mutations evolve. And some mutations might be moved down the road uh, to the high confidence mutation. This is just to explain to you how we classify the mutation. To be high confidence mutation, we have to see it at least th three times in the lab in three different isolates, independent isolates, different patients. And it has to confer the same resistant phenotype each time. Um, if you don't find it three times, we uh, then look at the literature and also curated database. WHO uh, recently published is a second version of uh, its mutation catalog. Uh, if you are interested, you can go to WHO uh, website. Uh, and basically, it's a list of mutation uh, in, in the target gene and what the phenotype prediction is. So a combination of uh, you know, the, those three things uh, can also help to move uh, the mutation into the high confidence list. Those are the predictive values of whole genome sequence. And I just want you to focus particularly on this line here, which is a susceptibility predictive value, which is pretty much asking how good the bioinformatic pipeline and the whole genome sequence is uh, to predict susceptibility, not resistance, susceptibility to drugs. And you see that these predictive values for all the drugs are extremely high. So in 2018, based on this very, very high number, we took the decision to 
stop doing phenotypic testing on all isolates that were found pan-susceptible by whole genome sequence. And by doing so, we drop 80% of our phenotypic testing, which is major. So it freed us to do, uh, I guess, other things. And, and cost-wise, it was also a, a huge, huge saving. So this is our reporting algorithm with whole genome sequence. So if you don't have any mutation identified, or sometimes you have a mutation, but a mutation that we call neutral mutation. A, mut a neutral mutation is a mutation that we know when it's present is not conferring any resistant phenotype. Then the strain is reported susceptible and the DST is not performed any longer. And we issue a final report. Sometimes with some high confidence mutation, then we report as resistant and we issue an intermediate report with phenotypic DST pending. And then when the phenotypic DST is finalized, we issue the final report. And the same apply with what we call the unknown mutation. An unknown mutation is a pretty much a mutation that we just don't know what it does. Uh, we don't find it in the WHO catalog, for example, not in the literature. It's the first time we see it uh, uh, you know, in the lab. So we have to test phenotypically to see if this mutation confer resistance or not. So you'll see it sometimes, uh, a note on the report where you see unknown mutation. And then uh, generally we, um, we schedule a DST for this specific gene and this specific drug. We don't do the whole panel when you have an unknown mutation. Okay, and this is just an example of the report that the submitter see, where you have the susceptibility profile on the left. Here it's an MDR strain. And we always give you uh, uh, what mutation correspond to our prediction. Uh, in this case, RPOB and KG mutation. And on the right, uh, we see that uh, all the, the full panel uh, for MDR, the full panel of phenotypic uh, testing is, is, is still pending and the final report of course, we'll have all the final results for, for the phenotypic. So, as I said already, the limitation of whole genome sequence is that it can only be done on culture. So you still rely upon having this primary culture from the specimen, okay? So in order to go around this, we decided to uh, use what I mentioned earlier, which is a targeted next generation sequencing. And you, you probably, most of you received uh, this uh, letter uh, in 2023 uh, mentioning that we were implementing uh, this new assay uh, in the lab. So what is next uh, generation, uh, targeted next generation sequencing? So instead of focusing on the entire genome, we decide to focus on specific gene. And by doing so, we're gonna generate less sequence because you know, the, the number of, of targets is more limited. And we're going to get, be able to amplify this, uh, this uh, target gene. And by being able to amplify by PCR this target gene, we're going to increase the sensitivity of the assay. Okay? And by increasing the sensitivity of the assay, then we're going to be able to test directly primary specimen instead of relying on uh, culture. You can use it on isolates. It works also just fine. But we can move a little bit earlier even in the process by testing directly on sputum. Again, very simplistic view of the thing, DNA extraction, amplifying the target, doing your library preparation, putting it on the sequencer, and then you uh, go uh, through your bioinformatic uh, pipeline to analyze the, the, the results. These are the targets that are uh, implicated in uh, uh, the resistance to first and second line antimicrobials and are uh, in our targeted NG NGS. Um, we also developed uh, a second targeted NGS assay that specifically uh, look for uh, resistance to the drugs of the BPAL regimen. Okay, Pertomanin, linezolid, betacoline, slash clofazimine. And to answer the uh, Joe, uh, was it a question or a comment about bedaquiline? Uh, bedaquiline resistant is still rare in this country, but we already saw it. And we already saw it particularly in patients who are starting to relapse BPAL regimen. I don't think it happened in New York yet, but it certainly happened in other states. 
Uh, the most concerning thing for me, besides the fact that you see Bedakulin resistance, and it was mentioned in a meeting that Joe and I attended last week, is that you also see resistance in strains that have never seen the drug. From the get-go, they have a mutation and they are resistant. And you see it for pretermanib and you see it for bedaquilib. Can you imagine if you have this background and you start to build more resistance with a strain that have already pretermanib and or bedaquilin resistant? This is a recipe for complete disaster. Basically, you're back to square zero with you know, the whole regimen and, and the 18 to 24 months. So I don't mean to rain on the parade, but that's that's concerning. And and we are, we are not the only one to share the concern uh, from what we heard uh, last uh, last week. Anyway, moving on. So the TNGS is very specific. Also, uh, we uh, here run a few of the organisms that you found pretty commonly in in sputums or in the respiratory. And you see that it's only specific for Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Which means that, by the way, uh, if you use it on culture, on mixed culture, sometimes you have culture, uh, as David mentioned, with our TB and another NTM or other things, that will work. You'll be able to sort out the, the, you know, the target gene of TB and, and, and completely ignore whatever else is there. And though you will still be able to get a result, even if your culture is not pure. And that was just a validation when you see there was a perfect concordance between the whole genome sequence that we use as a gold standard and the TNGS. So, so the, one of the main limitations that we still have uh, remains the sensitivity uh, on specimens that have a very low load of bacilli. Okay. You see it works fairly well when you have a four plus smear, a three plus smear, you start to lose a little bit with a two plus. When you go down to plus or negative sputum, the sensitivity really drop. And we see more, much more failures of the, of the assay. So this is something that we are really working on right now. We have a way to, to, to work around that. So, but sometimes um, you, you will receive reports where you're going to see all the targets fail. And this is most of the time because uh, the specimen was uh, very, very low uh, in, in, in bacilli count. So we receive approval in April 2023. I already said you use it on culture or respiratory specimen. And this is pretty much our molecular testing algorithm from uh, MTB now. Uh, and you see that uh, when you have a process specimen that is TB positive, we uh, immediately perform targeted next generation sequencing. And we can also do it on isolate. It won't be systematic. We can do it on isolate upon request. If somebody thinks that you know, they would need this because the culture is mixed and because please contact us and upon special request, we will run our targeted imaging and sequencing on, on, on an isolate. Okay. Uh, and then when we get the culture, of course, all genome sequencing and if necessary, phenotypic BS. And these are the reports that you will receive for the TNGS. This is an example of a, of a completely pan susceptible. So you have, you can have the name of the assay on the report. Uh, you can have a, the profile of uh, antimicrobial susceptibility, and you can have a disclaimer telling you that we will still do whole genome sequence because it's still more comprehensive than the target and uh, the TNGS. Uh, of course, when we uh, get a positive culture, and if appropriate, we will also do phenotypic testing. This is an example of a uh, drug uh, of uh, isolate resistant to INH. So a little bit like the whole genome sequence, we tell you the predicted phenotype and we tell you the mutation that is present. But it's from a sputum, not from a culture, which saves a lot of time. And an example of an unknown mutation here, where we don't know what the mutation does. Uh, uh, and generally, when we get a positive culture, we will reflex to uh, phenotypic testing for, for refamping. So I would like to finish this talk by two, two examples that really uh, illustrate the, the power of, of this, uh, this uh, targeted next generation sequencing. The first example was a patient. Uh, she was 32 weeks pregnant. Uh, and uh, her sputum was found uh, positive for TB complex and predicted refampin resistance by gene expert. And the sputum was sent to Wadsworth Center for testing. 
okay? So, sputum is received at T0. Day one, we detect, we confirm the presence of TB complex in the sputum. Day five, we issue the TNGS report and this strain is XDR. So in five days, we were able to tell the physician that they were dealing with an XDR strain, okay? Just to give you an idea now of the timeline, the culture came positive at day 13. The whole genome sequence was obtained at day 26. And by the time we finished the whole phenotypic uh, sequencing, it was 84 days. So imagine with no molecular assay, you would have waited 84 days to get a result for an XDR strain. In five days, we were able to tell you that yes, you were dealing with an extremely difficult case. This is a huge game changer. I mean, for, for I think for the physicians, uh, it's, 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 it's for me, this case blew our mind. And it was actually the first XDR uh, case that we ever <laughs> diagnosed, uh, you know, by uh, directly from a, from a, from a, a direct, uh, from a sputum. Um, hopefully we won't have too many. <laughs> so the second case also was uh, extremely, uh, extremely impressive. We received, um, it was a 12 month old baby, very sick in ICU, uh, had been infected by your TB positive relative. Uh, we didn't have any result yet on the person who infected the baby. So we didn't have any idea of what the susceptibility profile was. And the CSF of this baby had grown uh, MTB. So he had TB meningitis, okay? So the isolate was sent to, the, to our lab uh, for all genome sequence, but we decided to accelerate a little bit and use a TNGS, which is even faster than whole genome sequence. So this is a timeline. We received the isolate at 2 p.m. By 4 p.m., we had to do the, what we call the heat kill. At the end of the day, we had extracted the DNA and the PCR was set up. And the following day at 7 a.m., we did the library prep. 11 a.m. sequencing, we got the result at 1 p.m. So in 23 hours, we were able to tell the physician that the isolate fortunately was pan-susceptible. And they could basically be reassured that they were on the right track. Um, it was important because the baby was coming from um, part of the world where drug resistance was definitely in the picture. And we didn't have any data on the index case, the person who infected the baby. Again, uh, in the pre-molecular era, you wouldn't have had this result that fast. Okay, so just a little bit of a summary of uh, the impact of TNGS. Uh, generally, we had a 15 days improvement for primary specimen. When we have a contaminated culture, we have a 43 days improvement. Uh, you know, by the time you try to purify the TB from a contaminated culture to do the testing, uh, you save a lot of time. And if necessary, we push uh, it through and we can get results in less than 24 hours. Let me just specify that the push through is really for exceptional cases uh, because it requires that we kind of disrupt our workflow. Uh, so if you think you have this very high profile case that really needs very quick results, please, please let us know and we'll do our best to, to, to help you. TNGS is not an end by itself. We always have to follow with by whole genome sequence that would give you more comprehensive data, cover additional targets. And also whole genome sequence will give you all the information necessary for the epidemiological investigation. And also if required, TNGS will not replace phenotypic DST, particularly if you have uh, a known mutation. Uh, and it also, uh, and especially for the newer MTB drugs, uh, because what I didn't tell you is that uh, right now, uh, the prediction of drug susceptibility or resistance for the new drug is not good yet because uh, this is a work in progress. The knowledge is evolving. 
and 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 right now uh, we still need the phenotypic testing for beta coline protamandine and azolid. Uh, mutations could be just a flag that tell you that you you need to do phenotypic, but we cannot predict yet just from uh, genotype results. And this is just a summary comparing uh, both assays, uh, I would say. And uh, this is it. So this is a, it takes a village to do this, um, this type of work. Uh, and I'll be happy to uh, answer any question if you have any. Any questions for Dr. Escrier? Uh, is there any, um, uh, can you do the tar targeted uh, uh, next gen sequencing on anything other than sputum? So Rhino has been approved only for sputum and isolate. But we are working in validating it for other type of specimen. Yes, not yet. We can probably run it, uh, but let's suppose to see. if there is a really, if there is a, again a very high profile case, we will do it. But we won't be able to issue a f official report. Uh, the validation on the other type of specimen is a work in progress. We are working on it, uh, but then you have to go through the the approval process, uh, you know, from New York State and before we can go live with it uh, and offer it to New York State patients. Yeah. Hi, Vincent. I don't have a, a question. I just want to give a program plug here for Wadsworth. And I'm Cheryl Kearns from the New York State TB program. I'm the data unit director and program manager. And I just want to give a plug for the, you know, lab and what they do and the amazingness of this testing. And please give you a reminder that none of this happens if the specimen doesn't go to Wadsworth immediately. Everybody has their standard practices for collecting a specimen in a patient room, in a, you know, wherever, getting it to your, your lab in your hospital, getting it to your contracted local laboratory, Every additional step that takes, takes away from the benefit to the patient. So if you can, when you're collecting three, send one right to Wadsworth and send the others through your normal practices. Thank you. What? Thanks Cheryl for, for, for the advertisement. But I want to, I want to put a caveat on, on, on this whole thing. Yes, you're, you're right. However, I want to reemphasize that we do not rule rule out TB. So if you want to send us a specimen, it has TB as somehow to be part of the possibility. You know, we're not here just, or just in case we're gonna test TB and rule it out. I mean, you have to have some clinical evidence, you have to have whatever, uh, otherwise we couldn't perform, you know, uh, this type of work. We are inundated with, uh, with an irrelevant specimen, at least for TB. We have a question from the chat. This goes to your prior comment. Is the TNGS only for pro-positive MTB specimens? Yes. Okay. It has to be positive for TB because okay. it's negative. There's no DNA there. And we won't be able to do TNGS. Thank you. And could you comment on the cost? I'm sorry, Dr. Schluger. Yes. Great. And, and I don't want to start a big thing here, but this is kind of a sore point for me. Um, why... Does anybody anywhere do AFP smears anymore? No, no, I, I, that's a very serious question. Thank you. No, I mean it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I've been, well, you're going to have to ask TB control for that because, I mean, I, I don't even care about the, the, the smear result because we have PCR assay that we're going to tell us that is there. Uh, it's more like following. Uh, Cheryl, you probably can answer this better than me. I mean, my people were, would be so happy to drop the AFB because the microscopy is so fastidious and so uh, you know, they could do other things. You, 
You're you're preaching for the choir. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, maybe you have your say on this. <laughs> you do agree. Yeah. So there there is a question from the chat about the cost of TNGS and these molecular advanced platforms versus traditional. So it depends. It depends on what your volume is. Generally, we are batching. Okay. So we do 24 at a time. So if you do 24 at a time, uh, we uh, the cost is $70 a specimen, which is not huge when you, you know, and we are able to do, uh, by, again, piggybacking uh, with, because for the whole gene sequence, you can run in cells with other organisms. I mean, it doesn't matter because they have a specific uh, tag that, uh, you know, the, the machine will be able to sort out. Uh, and uh, it's the same range of price for whole genome sequence. We are down to $70, $80 a specimen, which is really very, very cheap when you think of how much whole genome sequence used to cost. Uh, and it takes five, six hours. It used to take months to sequence a genome uh, before. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a completely different world these days, yeah. I, I see one more question here. Thank you, Dr. Escobar. And uh, just to follow up on Dr. Schluger's uh, comment, actually. <laughs> yeah. uh, so as a fellows, we go to Westchester Medical Center and Metropolitan Hospital in the uh, city. So here we have uh, our county lab, which any sputum comes there, they will run the smear and the MTB-PCR. Yeah. In uh, Metropolitan Hospital, the sample actually goes to Northwell and Northwell works on it. The problem with that is if the resident or somebody who collected the sample didn't print through the labels of MTB PCR and just printed the labels of uh, AFB smear, they will only run smear. So is there on the state point, is there any yes. guidelines for these uh, labs it's in the for standard. running? It's in the lab standards. They have to do PCR on the, I mean, they don't follow the standards if they do this. Yeah. I mean, that's plain and simple. I, because I mean, the, the, New York State has a set of standards, uh, general standards, and specifically uh, section uh, specific standard. And mycobacteriology is one of the section. And this is specifically uh, stated that uh, you can't just do it. You need to do, when you have a sputum, you need to do uh, maybe AB if you want. Um, you need to do, um, well, not if you want, it's still in the standard. Uh, you need to do a NAT and you need to do culture. Culture, regardless of whatever yeah. order came yep. from the primary piece. Yep. And uh, this uh, applies to non-sputum samples too, or yeah. mostly for sputum. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, thank you. And I, I would say if you see an AFB positive sputum and PCR negative, don't send it to us because it's probably not TB. You know, I mean, uh, <laughs> well, you can send it down the road if you want to identify the NTM. But uh... <laughs> mm -hmm. well, thank you very much, Dr. Create. We're going to take a break now. We have coffee and light refreshments in the cafeteria across the way from the hall. And we'll come back, let's say, um, 
Hey, we're going to get started again in just one minute. You could grab your seats. Thank you all. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Neil Schluger, who is Dean of the School of Medicine and Professor of Medicine at New York Medical College. His academic career has focused on tuberculosis, and he has published over 150 papers on various aspects of TB, including host immune responses, molecular diagnostics, epidemiology, and clinical trials of new drugs and regimens in latent and active TB. For 25 years, he has been a principal investigator in the CDC's Tuberculosis Trials Consortium and led the consortium from 2000 to 2016. He's also an associate editor of the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. Dr. Schluger. It's our pleasure. Right, thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Don. Um, what I'm going to try to do, uh, try to keep on the schedule as best I can, uh, is just go a little more in detail about some of the current and uh, I hope um, soon to be future reality advances in the treatment of latent and active tuberculosis. And really the goal, uh, as the slide said, is to develop uh, treatment regimens that are faster, better, and safer. Um, and that's really the motivation here, um, no conflicts. Um, so why do we, this, this is what I'm gonna talk about today. Why in fact do we need new drugs for TB? Um, and then I'll talk about new drugs and regimens for the treatment of latent TB for drug susceptible active tuberculosis. and. Uh, drug-resistant active tuberculosis. So I always like to start with a big picture epidemiology um, uh, view, just to remind people that tuberculosis uh, remains one of the great public health problems in the world. Um, there are about 10 and a half million new cases of TB every year, about one and a half million deaths. That makes tuberculosis still the leading single, the leading cause of death due to a single infectious agent, which is uh, an amazing thing actually to say in 2024. Um, more people, because TB has been a treatable disease for a long time. More people die in the world every year of TB than die of malaria or HIV infection. Um, and now, again, fortunately, I guess, more people die of TB than die of COVID. Um, and if you look on a worldwide level over a long period of time, um, this is just from 2010, but we could go back probably to 2000, the number of cases of TB in the world every year has declined very, very little in the last 15 uh, to 25 years. That's a scandal of another sort and a topic for another day. But um, there's a lot of TB in the world. Um, and uh, um, it's, a, as I said, a major public health problem. Um, just to give some relative uh, idea, 45% of all TB cases in the world occur in just three countries, China, India, and Indonesia. Um, and the incidence of TB in those countries ranges from about 100 to 200 or so per 100,000. Um, the highest incidence rate of TB in the world are in countries in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and South Africa. The rate of TB is somewhere between 500 and 1,000 per 100,000. In the United States, as Dr. Brzezinski pointed out, the rate of TB is still only about 2.6 or 2.7 per 100,000. And in New York City this year, I don't know what about seven or something like that, seven per 100,000. Um, but around the world, still an enormous public health problem, despite the fact that in theory, we have regimens that can cure almost everybody um, on earth who has active TB. Um, in, in addition, in many countries in the world, HIV co-infection is a major problem. HIV co-infection is really what drives, has driven the TB uh, epidemic in sub-Saharan Africa for many years, um, much less of a problem in China, India, and Indonesia, but um, in many parts of the world still important. And then multi-drug resistant TB, which really first came to the world's attention in New York City in the late 80s and early 90s when um, in 1992, for example, uh, when I started working at Bellevue, about 13 and a half percent of all TB cases uh, in New York City were due to multi-drug resistant strains. And as you saw in Dr. Brzezinski's talk last year, only 13 new cases of uh, MDR-TB in the whole country. Um, but in some parts of the world, there's a lot of drug-resistant TB, um, uh, particularly here in Russia and countries in the former Soviet Union. So Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, Kazakhstan here. 
um, where more than 20% of all new cases of TB are due to multidrug resistant strains. So a lot of TB in the world, some parts of the world, a lot of HIV, um, some parts of the world, a lot of multidrug resistant TB, um, all of those present challenges to TB. Um, how do patients around the world do if they have tuberculosis? If you have drugs susceptible to tuberculosis around the world, you do pretty well um, on the whole. Um, these are the most recent data made available by the World Health Organization. You can see that for patients with drug susceptible TB, about 85% um, have what the WHO uh, defines as treatment success. Um, a little less than that in certain regions of the world, um, in the European region and the Americas actually. Um, uh, less than that. So even with drug susceptible TB, there's certainly room for improvement um, in outcomes of treatment. Um, and if you look at multidrug resistant TB, now most of these data uh, obtain from a time and in patients, uh, a time before and in patients who were not able to have access to BPAL and BPOM. I'll talk about that a little more. Dr. Rosinski's already mentioned that. Um, but outcomes of patients with multidrug resistant TB are really bad around the world, um, with uh, only about 50% of patients who are treated having a successful outcome. Um, and again, not the topic of the talk today, but um, of, of the entire universe of patients with multidrug resistant TB in the world. Uh, probably only about 20 to 30 percent or maybe 40 percent at the most, but 20 to 30 percent are even treated, okay? So most people with MDR-TB are not diagnosed and most people with MDR-TB are not treated. Of those who are treated, only 50 percent have a good outcome. So a lot of room for improved outcomes in multidrug resistant TB. Um, now, I like history. Um, we heard a great talk on the history of TB uh, at the beginning of the symposium by Dr. Halperin. Um, this is a very important paper, not only in the history of TB, but in the history of medicine. I'm sure many of you have seen this. The streptomycin trial of tuberculosis done by the British Medical Research Council, published in 1948 in the British Medical Journal. This is the first randomized control trial that was ever published in medicine for anything. Um, so a landmark not only in the history of TB, but uh, in the history of medicine. And this was the paper that really established the fact that antibiotic therapy of tuberculosis was effective and the only effective way to treat tuberculosis. We learned a lot from this trial, including the fact that you can't treat tuberculosis with only one drug, um, although almost everyone in this trial received streptomycin initially improved, um, the vast majority of those patients relapsed with streptomycin-resistant TB. So we learned a lot. Now, I'm going to fast forward a lot. Um, uh, now and just um, tell you where we are with treatment regimens for latent tuberculosis infection. So until quite recently, I think most of us were used to the fact that uh, the standard treatment for latent tuberculosis infection was either six or nine months of isoniazid given daily. Um, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands um, as to how many people have prescribed this in the last 10 years, but if it's more than zero, I'll be disappointed um, uh, because this is a regimen that should not be used uh, uh, as first-line treatment for latent tuberculosis uh, anymore, uh, except in a few particular circumstances. Um, and I'll go into that. So the nine, six or nine months of daily isoniazid uh, definitely had some advantages. It's about 80% effective. It reduces the chance that if a person has latent TB infection that they will develop active TB by about 80%. It's very, very cheap. Um, isoniazid costs essentially nothing. Um, in this day and age, and so for that reason, it's, it's really universally available. Um, on the other hand, there are lots of disadvantages. It's nine months long, um, and there's a tremendous amount of data um, from New York and other places that most patients who you start on this regimen will never finish it. Um, and if you don't finish it, it's certainly not 80% effective. Um, and as you know, side effects are uncommon. So um, uh, I'm happy to say I think this is certainly been relegated to third-line therapy. We'll come back to that in a minute. What about drug-susceptible TB? Um, as everyone knows, the standard regimen for drug-susceptible TB is a, an induction phase of two months, two months of isoniazid, rifampinpyrazidamide, and ifamutol, followed by a continuation phase, four months of isoniazid and rifampin. Again, there's a lot of good things about this regimen, essentially 100% effective for patients who have 
uh, drug susceptible TB it, uh, in general has a low relapse rate of about 5%. This is also very, very inexpensive now. Um, uh, everywhere in the world. Uh, this is an inexpensive regimen. Uh, and so it also essentially is universally available. On the other hand, it's still six months long. In some subgroups of patients, even with drug susceptible TB, the relapse rate can be very high. So if you have a patient with extensive bilateral cavitary TB um, or someone uh, who's severely undernourished, starts off treatment with a a BMI that's less than, uh, let's say, 90% of ideal body weight. Um, patients like that, the relapse rate can be as high as 15% or more. Um, so uh, you have to pay attention to your uh, individual patient characteristics. Again, side effects can be common with this. And then I, I showed you earlier, and that's why I showed you, um, in parts of the world where HIV co-infection is common, this can be a difficult regimen to use in combination with HIV medications. Um, the, the treatment of TB in HIV-infected persons is way beyond the scope of what I'm going to talk about today, but um, this is a very tricky issue. And then, of course, by definition, um, this regimen is not useful against multidrug-resistant strains. So if you could um, wave a magic wand, and invent the best TB drugs and regimens in the world, what characteristics would those drugs and regimens have? Um, they would be highly effective against both so-called drug susceptible and drug resistant strains of MTB. They would lead to treatment shortening, cure active TB in two months um, or less. Um, they would be safely and easily tolerated in all populations, including children and pregnant women. There's enormous problem uh, in TB women, pregnant women and children have been excluded from most clinical trials of TB drugs and regimens, uh, and we're not sure what the safety of all these drugs are in those populations. We'd like drugs that would be very safe to use in those populations. We'd like drugs that don't have interactions with other important classes of drugs, especially existing TB drugs and antiretroviral drugs that we use for HIV therapy. Um, and the drug, the drug should be easy to administer. Um, oral drugs are certainly easier than parenteral. Parenterally administrate, uh, administered drugs, um, I think oral are uh, better than inhaled. Inhaled drugs for TB is an idea that's been around for a long, long time. Um, and uh, it may be true that inhaled are better than parental, parenteral. At the moment, there really are no inhaled drugs for TB, but people work on this, so they would Ease of administration is important, and these new drugs would be expensive. You know, we're all used to um, all these new miracle drugs for everything that come on the market that cost you know fifty thousand dollars a year. Um, that's just not feasible. And TB, TB largely still remains a disease of poor people living in poor countries. Uh, and although I think um, governments should be willing to pay more for TB drugs than they are. Patients with TB, their lives are just as meaningful as the lives of anybody else with any other disease. Um, uh, still, um, we'd like these drugs to be inexpensive. So I'll tell you right now, there is no drug that meets all these criteria, obviously. Um, but this would be the goal, and this should be the, um, uh, the ideal. That we should have our eye on this uh, as we develop TB drugs. OK, this slide is why you took organic chemistry in college. Um, just for this slide in this talk, um, uh, and these are the structures of really the drugs that by and large are changing the landscape of the treatment of uh, TB. And I won't quiz you on telling me what class of drugs these are just by looking at their structures. Um, but drugs like rifapentine, bedaquiline, pertominid, moxifloxacin, delamidid, alanazolid, you've heard um, about them. And, and uh, these are the drugs that I'll talk about in a little more detail. They have a, a variety of mechanisms of action. Um, this slide shows you the mechanisms of action of really just about all the TB drugs that are clinically in use now, including some that are um, in late stages of clinical development. Um, lots of the TB drugs we have work by inhibiting the cell wall synthesis of mycobacterium tuberculosis. Those are the ones that are pointing right to the cell wall. Um, drugs like rifampin work within the cell to <coughs> rifampin, for example, and all the rifamycins. Um, work by uh, binding to a drug called uh, RPOB, which encodes the beta chain of, of RNA synthesis. And so rifamycins prevent RNA synthesis, kill the cell that way. Um, Bedaquilin, which you've heard mentioned a few times, uh, interrupts energy metabolism in the cell by inhibiting ATP synthase. Um, and there are some novel other drugs that work in other ways, but um, 
for you fans of um, uh, cell biology. This is how these drugs work. I want to say a little bit more about rifapentine in depth um, because I think uh, rifapentine and the rifamycins generally remain uh, really the most important classes of drugs that we have to use TB, to treat TB. And the rifamycins, the use of rifamycins in the treatment of latent TB, I think really has revolutionized our treatment of latent TB. Um, if this cyclopental ring here were a methyl group, CH3, instead of this ring, it would be rifampin. So um, the substitution of a methyl group for this ring makes it rifapentine. It works exactly the same way rifampin works, um, but that little chemical change gives it better MICs against TB than rifampin, a much longer half-life. So you give um, a dose of this, it stays in the bloodstream for a long time uh, and can build up high serum levels. Um, and it has a little bit less drug-drug interactions than rifampin does, but um, they're still there. So um, I think this was a great leap forward uh, in the treatment of latent tuberculosis. Um, the development of a regimen of three months of once a week rifapentine and isoniazid for latent TB infection. Dr. Brzezinski and I participated in this trial as part of the TB trials consortium. We enrolled, I don't know, about 450 of the patients in this trial um, in which patients with latent TB infection were randomized to get nine months of daily isoniazid or three months of once a week isoniazid 900 milligrams and rifapentine 900 milligrams. Um, in this trial. And to make a long story short, this was published now a long time ago. Um, the uh, rifapentine INH arm was um, at least as good as the isoniazid arm in preventing people from going from latent to active TB. It was a large trial, 8,000 patients um, with latent TB and in the INH arm, 15 developed active TB and in the rifapentine isoniazid arm, seven. Um, developed. So it was certainly non-inferior and possibly superior to nine months of INH. And importantly, um, liver, liver function abnormalities, hepatotoxicity um, was much less common um, with the INH rifapentine arm than with nine months of daily isoniazid. So I think um, that was, as I said, a really a great leap forward. We went from 270 doses of medicine of isoniazid to 12 and showed just as effective results. Um, a few years later, Dick Menzies up at McGill uh, published a study looking at four months of daily rifampin versus nine months of daily isoniazid. Um, and again, show, whoops, showed um, equivalence here, four months of rifampin was as good as nine months of isoniazid in treating latent um, TB. Um, more recently, this is now about four or five years old, Dick Chason published, I think, a very provocative study looking at one month of daily rifapentine um, with isoniazid in preventing active TB among HIV-infected patients with latent TB. Um, and you can see here, these, these are two lines um, that are really identical. This is the rate, um, the percentage of patients who remained free of TB, whether or not they were treated with isoniazid or one month of rifapentine plus isoniazid um, in this case for many, many months versus one month of isoniazid and rifapentine. You can see the lines are identical and basically um, all patients remain free of active TB. Now there are some caveats here. This study has been discussed a lot. Um, the patients with HIV infection in this trial had very well-preserved immune function, um, median CD4 cell counts um, were very high, um, and 70% of the patients had negative skin tests. So um, it's not clear that these patients actually had latent TB. Um, so your treatment for preventing active TB in people who didn't have latent TB to begin with probably should be pretty high. Um, so, so I don't, I don't know if this has really been a widely used regimen. Um, do you use it in the health department? No, um, but the paper got published in New England Journal and got a lot of attention. Um, but if you take all these together, um, and I know I've gone through this quickly, but these studies have all been out there for a number of years, and I think you're probably all familiar. Um, but uh, 
the bottom line in this day and age is if you have a patient with latent TB infection, your first and second line treatment should be rifamycin-based regimens for the treatment of latent TB. Um, whether or not you choose to do four months of daily rifampin or three months of once a week isoniazid rifapentine can depend on um, a bunch of things. Um, but both of those regimens, in my view, are vastly superior to nine months of daily isoniazid um, because of patient acceptability and treatment completion and adverse effects. Um, so there are still some challenges with the rifamycin-based regimens. Um, as I, I mentioned, and I think as most of you know, uh, rifamycins are very potent, inhibit, uh, potent inducers of CYP3A4, cytochrome P450 um, system for metabolizing lots of other drugs. And so you have to see if your patients are on drugs whose metabolism would be interfered with by rifamycins, and there are a lot of drugs that fall into that category, you know, warfarin, oral contraception, um, lots of anti-seizure drugs. So you really have to ask your patients if they're on those things and come up with alternatives if you need to. Um, rifampin itself is widely available and very cheap. Rifapentine sort of plus minus, um, the prices come down a lot. It's not always so available. So that could be a concern. Um, there was some concern about breeding rif uh, rifamycin resistance. That has really not been borne out, um, so I don't think that really is a concern. Um, so if you have a patient where drug-drug interactions are not a concern and, um, and, and you're treating them for latent TB, um, these rifamycin-based regimens should be the preferred regimens. Um, and really, you should only be using nine months of daily isoniazid uh, in patients who can't tolerate the rifamycins because of side effects or drug-drug interactions or something like that. Um, you'll have much better outcomes with rifamycin-based regimens. And now the World Health Organization recognizes that and endorses the use of these regimens um, really anywhere in the world in any sort of population. Okay. What about uh, improving treatment of drug-susceptible TB? Um, again, we have effective therapy for this, but could we do it um, in a way that's faster, safer, and less expensive? Um, I'm not going to go over this in too much detail because Dr. Brzezinski mentioned it, but um, th this was a study we did um, where we looked at whether or not treatment for drug susceptible TB could be shortened to four months. Um, and to make a long story, and the, and the strategy there was to shorten it for four months by substituting rifapentine for rifampin and moxifloxacin for ethambutol, and just giving that regimen for four months. And um, the study showed um, that that regimen, the rifapentine moxi regimen, basically was equivalent, I'm sorry, here it is, equivalent um, in terms of uh, favorable or unfavorable outcomes, uh, microbiologically anyway, um, to the standard six-month regimen for drug-susceptible TB, and it was um, about as equally well tolerated. But that was this is under the conditions of a clinical trial, and as you heard Dr. Brzezinski point out, in actual clinical use, it does seem that patients with this treated with this four-month regimen have um, a much greater frequency of adverse effects. Um, and so I think this regimen has not really moved into the clinic. So at the moment, um, certainly. Um, the standard six-month regimen, I think, is, is still the regimen, um, and, and I don't see that being displaced uh, anytime um, soon. Um, is there hope that things will get better? This is a, a nice graphic that just got published a couple days ago, a nice review paper by Eric Nuremberger and Dick Chason from Hopkins that shows you the whole timeline of TB drug development um, and the change in regimens for treating active TB. You see this huge gap from the 1980s to the 2010s where there were really no changes at all in the treatment of TB um, it's because there is very little drug development. But now there are a number of uh, drugs that are in development, and it's possible that some of these will allow us to treat TB, active TB, for less than uh, six months. Um, this made the news in the last couple of weeks, a drug called Quabodepistat. Um, not easy to say. Um, um, again, for all you organic chemistry fans, here it is. It has a novel mechanism of action um, it interrupts cell wall synthesis, but through an enzyme pathway that is not targeted by any other drug. Um, and uh, just recently at the CROI meetings, the Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections, an abstract was presented where um, data were shown from a, a phase two clinical trial 
where patients with drug susceptible TB uh, were treated with a four month regimen, um, quabodepistat, delaminid, and bedaquiline, so all novel TB drugs, versus the standard six month regimen of HRZE or RIPE if you prefer. Um, and at the end of treatment, all this is showing you at the end of treatment, 96% um, of patients treated with this four month regimen were culture negative uh, versus 90. 0.5% of patients treated with a standard regimen. That's just culture conversion. The really important clinical outcome is a relapse rate. So this is promising data, but by no means definitive, but it'll be interesting to see what happens with this drug. Um, and um, uh, there are other treatment shortening trials as well. Um, but at the moment, six months is what we have. Um, Rifampin resistant or multi-drug resistant TB, I showed you before, we still have very poor outcomes here. Um, and what changed the universe here, Dr. Brzezinski alluded to this, was um, the BPAL and then BPALM regimens um, that use bedaquiline and linazolid really as their cornerstone. So prior to the development of these regimens, if you had multi-drug resistant TB, you would be treated with a regimen of 18 to 24 months with injectables, lots of side effects. Um, intolerable for many patients, but um, the BPAL and BPOM regimens have really changed that. This is the Xenix study um, that looked at BPAL, which is bedaquiline pertominid, um, called PA824, linazolid for six months. And um, in this study, probably most people here haven't used too much bedaquiline or pertominid. Linazolid is a drug very widely used for um, methicillin-resistant staph infections in the hospital. Um, and so it's been out there. Um, for several years. When you use it for staff, you give it for a short period of time and it's generally well tolerated. You might get a little bone marrow suppression, but that's pretty much it. Um, when people started using it for TB for months and months and months, um, the side effect of peripheral neuropathy cropped up and that's a bad side effect because it's not always reversible. Um, and so uh, this study, the Xenix study, looked at um, lower doses of linazolid here 600 milligrams a day given either for the whole duration of six months or just for the first couple of months. And um, this study showed um, that uh, really you could um, lower the dose of linazolid to 600 milligrams, um, include it for six months um, and uh, achieve very high rates of cure, 91%, um, with what seemed to be manageable toxicity. Um, but and that's shown here, sorry, the safety analysis. Um, but peripheral neuropathy is still pretty common. I mean, you can see here um, a quarter to a little over a third of the patients with the best regimens got peripheral neuropathy. And although it often will get better, it sometimes won't. Um, the BPOM trial, uh, I think in that sense, represents potentially a real advance here. So this is the same regimen only with moxifloxacin added for the six months and a lower dose of linazolid. So you can see here, linazolid is given 600 milligrams a day just for the first four weeks and then lowered to 300 milligrams a day. And the outcomes here were excellent. So I think the BPOM regimen, um, as was mentioned earlier, really is becoming the standard in places where it's available for the treatment of multidrug resistant TB. And as I said, this is an enormous step forward in the treatment of drug resistant TB. Um, to go from 24 months to six months with a better cure rate and a regimen that's well tolerated um, seems like a miracle to those of us who have treated MDR-TB patients for a long time. Um, and, and WHO now endorses that. Um, so I'll finish up um, with these last two slides, um, the role of new drugs in TB treatment programs. Um, again, rifamycin containing regimens for the treatment of latent TB are highly effective and well tolerated and should I think always be your first line therapy for patients with latent infection. Um, the four month rifapentine moxie regimen seems to work under experimental conditions, but has been harder to use in clinical practice. Um, BPOM now, I, I think, really is the standard in places where it's available for the treatment of drug resistant TB. Um, and there's really, um, we, we hope we can consign the 18 to 24 month regimens to the junk heap. Um, there's still challenges. Um, drugs are not cheap. Drugs accept, not everybody lives in a place that has a lab as good as the Wadsworth lab. Um, it's really a, a, a blessing to be in New York and to have that kind of resource available. Um, 
new drugs are expensive. That continues to be a challenge. I think the optimal dose and duration of linazolid for the treatment of drug resistant TB is still an issue of some question. Uh, and uh, monitoring for emergence of drug resistance is becoming uh, a real question. Um, there are some places where already resistance to bedaquiline is uh, becoming quite common. Dr. Brzezinski and I were chatting about this. Um, some places where as many as 15% of cases are already resistant to bedaquiline. We don't want to lose that drug um, before we have it, so to speak. So still challenges, but enormous progress has happened. And with that, I'll stop. Thanks for your attention. Any questions from the audience? ID fellow. Right Anything online? Yeah. This. Ah. Uh, my question was regarding Dr. Keller. Remember the patient we uh, XDRTB we had in Westchester. What's your point on TDM level monitoring on uh, these uh, BPAL regimen? Yes. yes. Oh, for the BPAL regimens. Wow. Yeah. So, so therapeutic drug monitoring in general has been sort of a controversial issue um, in TB. You know, if you look at the whole history of the development of TB treatment. Um, it was sort of done without very sophisticated pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Um, so a lot of the levels that we say are therapeutic for a lot of the routinely administered TB drugs um, are just kind of made up, I would say, to a certain degree. Um, and, and I think in general, we don't do therapeutic drug monitoring um, unless we think a patient is on a regimen that should work based on the drug susceptibility test, um, and we think they're taking it. You know, I'm pretty sure they're taking it um, and they're failing. So I, I think that's the um, still would be my general approach. I don't think there's routine therapeutic drug monitoring for the BPOM regimen at all, as far as I know. So, um, so right now, there is like the University of Florida lab is running TDMs on that. My point is like when we have this high rate of uh, resistance, especially in particular communities and everything, maybe PDPK levels and everything is the point there. Like we may be subtherapeutically dosing them for a very long time without actually knowing it, which is so, causing. No, it, it, it's a good point. It's certainly a concern. I mean, in in Xenix and in TB Practical, which was the B palm regimen, um, the drug doses were standardized and not adjusted for PK or PD. Um, there was a little bit of weight adjustment, I think, in in Xenix, but um, therapeutic drug monitoring is not part of those studies. Um, so, so I think I still would probably reserve it for patients, as I said, who seem to be on a regimen that should work based on what you know from the lab and you're sure that they're actually taking it. Thank you. Oh. Hi, Dr. Schlicker. Um, I had a question for, you know, the for LTBI, the rifamycin therapies that are so successful in treating them, do we see the same success rates in... Okay, sorry. For the LTBI therapy, the rifamycin-based regimens that we that you know we say are so successful, is it the same success rates in the uh, places where the XDRTB seems to be predominantly endemic? For, for LTBI? Yeah. So, do you feel like it's? I mean, why is it that rifamycin seem to rifamycin therapy would um, work well for in these areas that have high rates of XDRTB? Oh, okay, okay. okay. So the question is, should you be using the rifamycin regimens in places where there's a lot of background drug resistance? Correct. Okay. So this, again, this has been a very controversial subject um, for a long period of time. The first thing is that even in places where there's a lot of MDR-TB, um, most people have drug susceptible TB. So so unless you know for sure, and, and there's even data that... Um, uh, a lot of household contacts of people with MDR-TB who are, you know, quantiferon positive um, may not have been infected by that index case, and they still have a reasonable chance of having drug susceptible TB. So on a programmatic level, um, I think we sort of assume that anybody with latent TB in usual circumstances has drug susceptible TB and should be treated the same way you treat anybody else. Now, are there exceptions to that? I mean, I think if I had a you know, an infant who was exposed in a home where the index case was MDR, 
right? The infant's not riding the subway or walking around town by himself or herself. And so it would be reasonable to assume that that person's infected with an MDR strain. Um, what the best treatment regimen for that is, there's very little guidance. Um, you know, if you know that the index, what the index case is susceptible is, and there's some drug, let's say, let's say the index case is resistant to INH and rifampin, but sensitive to quinolones, um, you could use quinolones um, in that case. Um, in a very young child, that could be problematic for other reasons. But, but if we're an adult, you could use a quinolone in that case. There's very little data about that. People have looked at PZA as a single agent for LTBI. People have looked at quinolones. Um, I think I'd be guided by the overall epidemiology and the drug susceptibility results for the index case. The, you know, bedaquiline in theory could work, and maybe there have been occasional patients treated with bedaquiline, but there's there's no there's no clinical study data on any of that. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sugar. Invite Dr. Hewlett up. Dr. Hewlett is the medical director for the Division of uh, Disease Control at Westchester County Depart Department of Health. He received his MD from University of Wisconsin Madison and went on to train internal medicine at Columbia, and he completed infectious diseases at Albert Einstein Montefiore. After a successful career in the pharmaceutical industry, Dr. Hewlett joined the Westchester DOH in 2019 just in time. <laughs> and um, he leads the TB investigations and services at the county. He rounds, in, in addition to everything else, he rounds as an infectious disease consultant at, at Calvary Hospital, and he's the vice chair of the board of directors for the IDSA. Thank you. Thank you. Is it on now? Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Keller. And, and I, since I'm the last speaker, uh, I want to take this opportunity to congratulate you and Dr. Chin for a great program. I think that everyone has gotten a lot of value out of this, but I also want to take this opportunity to uh, really rib you a little bit because this is a tough act to follow. I mean, the chancellor, the dean, the commissioner from New York, you know, the man who's in charge of the best TB lab in the, in the country, you know. <laughs> so this is a tough act to follow, but I'll do my best. <laughs> so... Dr. Hadsongate and I did not get together on this. Uh, he mentioned the train wreck, and uh, we didn't put our slides together at the same time. So actually, the theme of this is that the light at the, at the end of the tunnel for us, when we talk about tuberculosis and diabetes, actually is from uh, two oncoming uh, pandemics, tuberculosis and uh, diabetes. So I'm going to basically give you some brief history. It's very interesting about diabetes and TB, but I'm going to stick more to the diabetes part because you've heard most of the history. I'm gonna say a little bit about the epidemiology and background, again, focusing on the role of diabetes. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the clinical characteristics and the impact that diabetes has on the outcome in our patients with tuberculosis, some immunologic factors, which are extremely, extremely interesting. And I promised uh, Dr. Galipter that I would try to stay out of the basic science uh, lane, but I couldn't really do it. He usually tells me that when we're uh, giving the medical student talks that I'm supposed to stay on the bedside and uh, stay out of the lab. Uh, and so I'm gonna say a little bit about the management of TB and diabetic patients. And then we're gonna end by talking about the need for us to have a call to action and to have a team approach when it comes to uh, managing these difficult patients with tuberculosis and diabetes. So a little bit of the history, and this is very interesting. We're going from pancreatic extracts to artificial pancreas. The history is very interesting. In 1869, Paul Langerhans described in his doctoral uh, thesis the pancreatic islets, and it was accepted by the great majority that the definitive proof of the role of the pancreas in diabetes mellitus was the publication by Dr. Min Minkowski in 1893, demonstrating that pancreatectomy in dogs induced experimental uh, glucosuria. Uh, and Minkowski made uh, glycosuria disappear by, uh, in a depancreatized de dog by subcutaneous implants of pancreatic tissue. And he was the first to try unsuccessfully to restore the anti-diabetic action of the pancreas by the administration of pancreatic uh, extracts, either orally or parenterally. Now, we often forget, uh, and most of us didn't really know, but we forget some of these things, uh, if we go back in history, 100 years ago, 
uh, people who had type 1 diabetes died. Uh, there was no insulin. And so they had insulin-dependent diabetes, and with no insulin, these patients rarely made it into adulthood. And so the discovery of insulin was really a landmark discovery. And this took place in the, uh, in the, 19, uh, in the 1920s. And this is a picture of the first patient to, survive, to receive insulin, a uh, gentleman by the name of Leonard uh, Thompson. He was the first patient. He was treated in Toronto at the University of Toronto Hospital. And he actually survived uh, after going into uh, ketoacidosis or a diabetic coma in, uh, that was caused by ketoacidosis. And this sort of opened the door. And we go then from bench to bedside. Uh, many centers in the US, uh, prominent uh, diabetologists were attending uh, dying diabetic patients in their clinics. And the University of Toronto and the manufacturer Eli Lilly agreed that a selected group of physicians and institutions would be given the extract as soon as it became available. And they, were, uh, they sent them details, but they asked them not to uh, try to uh, do anything with this uh, on a commercial basis. And uh, some investigators, and you'll look at the name here that's actually familiar, uh, one of the investigators here, Dr. Jocelyn, uh, was one of the original people to study the use of insulin uh, in diabetic patients, in patients who were in a diabetic coma. And one of the things, that, one of the first uh, things that they published was diabetic coma and pulmonary uh, tuberculosis. And this was by Dr. Howard uh, Root. And uh, Dr. Jocelyn was one of the people uh, who was part of this study. And one of the things that's very interesting about this was that in those days, this was 100 years ago, uh, diabetes was much less common than tuberculosis. There was a lot more tuberculosis than there was diabetes. Uh, so they looked at this and they said the susceptibility of the diabetic to the development of pulmonary TB has occasioned comment by many people and diabetes preceded the development of active tuberculosis in the great majority of the cases that they studied. They actually looked at 245 cases of, uh, of uh, diabetics who had gone into a diabetic uh, coma. And the forms of tuberculosis other than pulmonary do not occur with a heightened frequency. And so they were not actually seeing more extra pulmonary TB, they were seeing more pulmonary TB. The development of tuberculosis seems to occur chiefly in cases of uncontrolled diabetes, especially coma cases. And its course is greatly affected by the degree of successful treatment of the diabetes. And although tuberculosis mortality rates were falling in their community at that time in Boston, the uh, incidence of tuberculosis among diabetics was increasing in spite of the lessening frequency of contact. And now this was published by these uh, authors back in 1934. And so I found this to be rather fascinating. And there was a, um, I guess you would say a loss of interest in diabetes and tuberculosis. And this loss of interest for many years had to do with two things. One, uh, we had insulin. And so now you could treat the diabetic. Uh, two, you actually had drugs that were effective in treating tuberculosis. You had streptomycin, as was mentioned earlier, pyrazinamide, isoniazid, ethambutol, rifampin. All of these drugs came, uh, came into play within a relatively short period of time. Uh, and everyone thought, well, we've solved this problem. We can treat the diabetes, we can treat the tuberculosis, and so that's all over, we can do something else. But in the late 1900s, the literature began to reemerge with world, the worldwide increase in type two diabetes, particularly uh, in TB endemic uh, countries. And today, type two diabetes mellitus is the most prevalent comorbidity among TB patients, and the World Health Organization considers it to be a threat uh, to TB control. Now let's look at this on a global perspective. You've heard this data already in terms of Dr. Schluger and others have given you this information in terms of how important tuberculosis is. You know, approximately 2 billion people in the world are infected with mycobacterium TB, up to 13 million, the estimated number of people in the United States living with latent tuberculosis. With diabetes mellitus, and this is uh, from 2000, 2021, globally 537 million adults aged 20 to 79 
were impa are impacted by diabetes. This is a global figure. And this is expected to rise to 783 million by the year 2045. Right now, the estimate is that about one in four people with TB disease, that is people who are symptomatic TB disease, also have diabetes. And so we do have a task in front of us. And so what is going to, what makes this so challenging? What are some of the immunologic deficiencies in diabetics and that uh, we have to be concerned about? And does this in any way um, impact their response uh, to therapy? Well, when we look at type two diabetes, uh, the cells in these patients fail to respond to endogenous insulin. And there seem to be multi-genetic predispositions for this. There may also be environmental triggers for this as well. We know that individuals who are obese, you have obesity-mediated factors. We know that obesity is associated with low-grade inflammation and that this ultimately results in hyperglycemia. And macrophages play a central role in our ability to control mycobacterium TB. Uh, we know that um, the, um, the macrophages and the white blood cells produce agents with antimicrobial activity. And these agents that are produced include uh, reactive nitrogen, oxidases, and also uh, there has to be an activation of some of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, including tumor necrosis factor, IL-1, IL-6, IL-8, and interferon. And of course, this interferon is, is of course one of the things that we measure when we are trying to determine if someone actually is infected. We know that hyperglycemia impairs the function of the macrophages. Also, it impairs the function of the neutrophils. So impairment in neutrophil chemoprophylaxis, chemotaxis, I'm sorry, and degranulation, that is impaired. There's impairment of the bacterial absor adsorption via the phagos phagos via phagocytosis. And what that means is that in order for the cell to engulf the bacterium, you have to have an effective mechanism. And that mechanism is essentially impaired when you have uh, high hyperglycemia, as we see in diabetes. Also, there's impairment in phagocytic killing activity. And so the bacterium can be engulfed, but then it may remain viable. And so once the macrophage dies, the viable bacteria is circulating again, and the person uh, is, of course, in a difficult situation because there's been incomplete eradication. And it's believed that this may be one of the reasons why some of the patients uh, with diabetes are more likely to fail therapy. Now, this diagram actually shows us a little bit more about um, how, these, uh, how these mechanisms actually work. Let's see if I can actually get this over here. I guess not. But um, we know that the entry point of, uh, of tuberculosis is the lung. And the bacterium is greeted by the alveolar macrophages or pneumocytes. And it is known that hyperglycemia impairs the activity of those cells. And so we know that that is something that is very important, and that is one of the things that occurs. One of the other things that we know is important here is that the polys play a role, as we said earlier. And we know that the function of the polys or the white cells is also impaired in a setting of hyperglycemia. And we know in some cases uh, that there may be intrinsic problems with the white blood cells. Now, to look at this further, when we have an increase in glucose, we see an increase in what we call uh, reactive uh, oxidation stress or oxidative stress. And that actually can be harmful because it can actually cause excessive amounts of inflammation. And when we have these, they call them AGEs or advanced glycolated um, uh, proteins and uh, this condition known as RAGE, which is an increase in the, uh, in the um, I guess you would call it the expression of receptors for these um, 
for these glycolated proteins, that that then can impair some of these immunologic um, functions that are listed here on this slide, including complement. It can have a detrimental effect on our complement system, both pathways, alternate and classic. And many of us, when we are learning about tuberculosis, we learn that the T cell mediated immunity is probably the most important. Back in the day when we thought about our immune system as being two arms, you know, T cells and B cells, and that the, the intracellular organisms were not really as affected by the uh, humoral responses, if you will. But we know that complement factor C3 and complement factor C5 are necessary in order for us to control tuberculosis intrinsically. And those functions are impaired when we have a situation of hyperglycemia. And we've already mentioned the phagocytosis. Now, what about apoptosis? What about that? Uh, apoptosis is the situation where we have, and this is a preferential mechanism for tuberculosis. The phagocytic cell will engulf the mycobacterium. And even though that phagocytic cell engulfs the mycobacterium, the, the plasma layer will remain intact. And so the bacterium stays there, even though the cell might have died. In diabetics, what happens is that you have necrosis. And what ends up happening then is the bacteria uh, leaves, the, leaves the phagocyte and it goes throughout the body, part to, other, to other parts of the body or through other parts of the lung. And so these are all things that uh, are occurring in diabetics, immunologic factors that make it more difficult for patients with diabetes to actually fight off the infections on their own, and even to fight off the infections when they are receiving, uh, receiving the uh, appropriate drugs. The other thing that's very interesting here is there's the cause and effect relation of tuberculosis on the incidence of diabetes mellitus. Mycobacterium tuberculosis infection alters host metabolic pathways. MTB and a protein known as ESAT6 increase glucose uptake and upregulate glycolytic genes and inhibit oxidative phosphorylation, causing what they call a Warburg effect. And this results in the production of, and this is where your biochemistry comes in. You had the importance of your uh, organic chemistry, but now to remember your biochemistry, uh, the, this results in the production of pyruvate, which is converted to lactate and it's secreted out. And this excess pyruvate is transported to the mitochondria to form acetyl, acetyl-CoA, and finally to produce ketone bodies. And of course, we know that when we have diabetics, if you have ketones, especially 3-hydroxybutyrate, uh, that that is not a good thing to have. Uh, and so these are some of the pathways that have been uh, described that seem to be important as far as uh, the cause and effect of what tuberculosis can actually do uh, to a host. And so the conclusion here is that active TB itself can actually induce various immune metabolic changes like increased inflammation, adipose tissue modulation, increased free fatty acid levels leading to the development of insulin resistance in patients that can lead to the development of type 2 diabetes if the tuberculosis is not managed properly or clinically. Now, what about the impact of diabetes on tuberculosis and the clinical manifestations? Uh, there is, and we know this, an increased risk of latent tuberculosis infection among persons with prediabetes and people with diabetes. There was a cross-sectional study that was done among refugees who were seen back in 2014 at a clinic in Atlanta, and this was conducted between 2013 and 2014. And the patients were screened for both diabetes mellitus using a glycosylated hemoglobin, A1C, and for a latent tuberculosis, they looked at the interferon test. And the results were that among 702 included patients, people that met the criteria, 681, or 97%, had both the H hemoglobin A1C done and quantiferons done. And overall, 7.8% of the patients had diabetes mellitus. Uh, 235, or 33.8%, had prediabetes. And uh, latent tuberculosis infection was prevalent 
in 31.3% of the refugees. And so this is certainly relevant uh, for, for, uh, for us today. Uh, latent tuberculosis infection prevalence was slightly higher among patients with diabetes mellitus, 43.4%, uh, and prediabetes mellitus, 39.1%, than in those without diabetes mellitus, which was 25.9%. Uh, and the refugees with diabetes mellitus and prediabetes were more likely to have latent tuberculosis than those without. And the authors concluded that the refugees with diabetes or prediabetes uh, from, for, from high TB burden countries were more likely to have latent tuberculosis than those without. And I think what we're getting at here is that now we are starting to see that diabetes is probably one of the most, if not the most important driver uh, of uh, tuberculosis as we're moving forward. Also, an interesting point here, when we talk about diagnosis, and we all are familiar with the quantiferon tests or the, uh, the IGRAs, as we call them, uh, we know, know that there may be a reduced sensitivity of this test in diabetic patients with smear negative tuberculosis. This was a, a uh, study that was done out in uh, San Francisco, California. I think it was the, uh, a, a community uh, health group out there that did this, and I won't go through all of the data, but they were just showing that in San Francisco, the quantiferon sensitivity was lower than that of the tuberculin skin test uh, in patients with diabetes. And there was a stratified analysis by sputum smear results, and they showed that this association was specific, specific to smear negative TB. Uh, and in contrast, the tuberculin skin test in those individuals was uh, not affected by the presence of diabetes. Now, I'm not advocating that we do go back to doing the skin tests in everyone, but I think this just shows the limitations of some of the laboratory tests that we have come to rely upon. Another thing that you will find very interesting, especially after some of the information that has been shared already, is that type 2 uh, diabetes may actually um, increase the risk of multi-drug resistant TB. You might ask, well, how does that actually happen? Well, we know, as you've heard already, resistance to antibiotic, uh, to, to anti-TB therapy is rising globally with close to half a million TB cases resistant to one of the most potent TB drugs, which is rifampin. There's now a growing body of literature that has linked uh, type two diabetes with an increased risk for MDR-TB. And there was a meta-analysis that was uh, conducted by these authors, and they included 24 observational uh, studies. And, they, um, and they, they revealed that type 2 diabetes is associated with higher rates of MDR-TB, uh, irrespective of the country or income level. And the association between type 2 diabetes and drug-resistant mutations was evident even among patients with newly diagnosed TB and was independent of the levels of glycemic control determined by the uh, hemoglobin A1C. And this suggested to the authors that previous anti-TB therapy did not account for, does not account for the higher risk of MDR-TB in these uh, diabetic patients. And so they uh, thought, well, maybe this is due to the fact that some of these patients have lower concentrations of isoniazid and pyrazinamide. And that was actually what they were able to show that lower concentrations of isoniazid and pyrazinamide were detected in the serum from TB patients with type 2 diabetes compared to the TB patients without type 2 diabetes. And so these reduced systemic concentrations of antibiotics could contribute to the development of drug resistance. Now, they didn't prove this, but this is something that is an observation. So it may make us pause, and there may be in certain situations, certain unique situations, as Dr. Sluger had indicated, if you have patients that are not responding as we expect, then certainly there's a role for uh, doing the drug monitoring. And we certainly have had occasion uh, from time to time in our health department to, uh, to do this, uh, this drug monitoring. And in one case, we did find that the patient had subtherapeutic levels of uh, isoniazid and, uh, and rifampin, and we actually raised the levels, and this patient actually started to respond favorably. Now, type 2 diabetes increases TB disease severity, and I think all of us know this. We see more severe disease on the chest X-rays. 
We're more likely to see cavitary disease. We're more likely to see bilateral disease. We're more likely to see uh, this be, it, it does seem to correlate with poor glycemic control. And we're also more likely to see atypical radiologic patterns. And so many of us who've looked at a lot of patients over the years who have TB, we expect to see certain types of classic X-ray findings, and we're more likely to see atypical radiologic patterns in our patients with diabetes. And so we have to be aware of that fact. We know that our diabetic patients have delayed culture conversion. They're more likely to be AFB smear positive. They have higher bacterial burdens. They have uh, more likely to have prolonged uh, duration of activity. Uh oh, it looks like we're you losing our power here. Uh, let's see. Uh, and anyway, uh, I think that our diabetic patients, I'll just proceed here they are more likely to have difficulties in terms of us being able to, uh, to clear their, their infections. Go back here. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, and the other piece, which is of course important to us in the public health department, is that patients with diabetes and prediabetes are more likely to transmit infection in household settings. Uh, poor glucose control, also increased the risk of mortality in a cohort study that was done in Taiwan. And, and uh, the authors in that study reported higher mortality among TB patients with uh, hemoglobin A1C that exceeded 9% compared to those with hemoglobin A1C that was less than 7%. Now, finally, I'll end by talking about the management of, of diabetes in people with active TB. Uh, and it's more complicated than walking and chewing gum. Uh, and so, so uh, pressures are certainly being placed on our healthcare system. And we saw this during COVID uh, where we were not able to pay as much attention to our tuberculosis patients. And a lot of people with tuberculosis were not diagnosed. And I think now we're starting to pay for that in that we're starting to see more patients emerging and we're trying to uh, take, take care of them. According to um, WHO, 49% uh, of surveyed countries saw a reduction in access of treatments for diabetes, for type two diabetes. And this of course has a detrimental effect on our ability to treat uh, tuberculosis. Um, and this is some data from uh, a few years ago globally if the number of new TB cases detected over a three-month period during the pandemic was reduced by 25%, was reduced by 25% compared to the level of detection prior to the pandemic, an additional 190,000 TB deaths were actually estimated uh, during that time. Now, TB itself may induce hyperglycemia. Active TB can induce transient stress hyperglycemia, which is extremely interesting to us. And this usually normalizes with TB therapy and does not require long-term diabetes management. Between 17 and 87% of TB patients who have not been previously diagnosed with type 2 diabetes have elevated blood glucose measurements upon the TB diagnosis. And it's important for us, therefore, the take-home message here to follow our patients longitudinally because the hyperglycemia may actually resolve with effective therapy for the uh, tuberculosis. And so it's important for us to monitor these patients very carefully. In addition, so that we don't continue them on uh, anti-diabetic therapy if they don't really need it. Hyperinsulinemia is a correlate with TB disease severity. And this is based on some recent data that has, that has, been, uh, has been published. And this recent study stratified individuals according to the degree of insulin resistance and showed that the degree of insulin resistance affects TB disease severity. And uh, whether elevated insulin concentrations and insulin resistance impact the manifestations of TB in patients without type two diabetes remains to be elucidated. But it's important for us to keep in mind that, diabetes, that insulin may have both a pro and anti-inflammatory property. And uh, I didn't realize this, but there have actually been cases or reports of patients with type 2 diabetes who have developed TB granuloma at the site of their in insulin uh, injections. 
And this suggests that insulin may actually contribute to the reactivation of uh, tuberculosis. And this is a diagram, I won't go through all of it, but it's very interesting because it's more than just the hyperglycemia. So I think the hyperglycemia, I think everybody knew that before we started this talk. Uh, but one of the things that we may not have known, and I was not aware of this, is that the hyperlipidemias or the dyslipidemias also can have an impact. And so increase in triglycerides, for example, will be cor correlates with an increased risk for treatment failure. Uh, statins will actually reduce the risk of active TB and reduce TB disease severity. And this is kind of a tricky situation because we know that the statins may interact with our rifamycins. And sometimes there's a temptation for us, and I know that I've been guilty of this, of saying, well, what if for the next four months we just tell them not to take the uh, cholesterol-lowering medications? Uh, but in fact, uh, those with increased cholesterol levels at the beginning of therapy actually seem to have a better prognosis than those who had normal uh, cholesterol levels. And so the statins actually may have a favorable impact. Another thing that's very interesting here is that metformin reduced the risk of primary infection with TB. That is individuals who had uh, type two diabetes or uh, if, if, if they actually were being treated with metformin, they had a reduced risk of going on to develop active uh, TB. So there are a lot more things that are important here aside from the, uh, aside from the um, uh, just the hyperglycemia. And metformin has the advantage of not producing hypoglycemia when used alone. It can reduce appetite, however, and so we have to be cautious uh, when it's being used in patients with renal or hepatic dysfunction. But it can help to shorten the course of TB therapy uh, in some of these patients. And it does act on the mitochondrial respiratory uh, chain and can reduce intracellular uh, growth of the organisms. Finally, what are the indications for insulin in patients with uncontrolled diabetes and tuberculosis? Well, according to these authors, uh, new patients with active TB, if there's a hemoglobin A1C exceeding 9% or a fasting blood glucose exceeding 200. New patients with active TB and ketonuria uh, or hyperosmolar symptoms. Patients with active TB on two oral drugs who are not reaching glucose targets and patients with active TB who are significantly catabolic. Also patients with active TB with significant liver or renal uh, dysfunction. And keep in mind that when we look at our anti-tuberculous drugs, and I think that some of this has already been mentioned, the rifampins will have an impact on the cytochrome P450, inducing the cytochrome enzymes, thereby accelerating the elimination of, the T of, of, of drugs like the sulfonyl ureas. Uh, and this can have a reduced effect and can lead, to, uh, can lead to problems in terms of hyperglycemia. Isoniazid also inhibits the cytochrome P450 and leads to a reduced elimination through, uh, through the action of the uh, CYP2C9 and persistent effect and the risk of hypoglycemia. And bedaquilin is an enzyme inducer and can, re can reduce the effect of uh, anti-diabetic uh, drugs. And one of the other challenges which has just come up, or well, actually, we've been going through this for the last few years, uh, is the fact that there have actually been shortages of insulin. And uh, if we think about this, we don't usually think about it in this way, but actually, if you have shortages of insulin, uh, this could, in fact, have a negative impact on the rates of uh, tuberculosis. And so I'll end by just saying, in order for us to manage this, this is a difficult, uh, complex situation. And uh, I think we're calling for a, uh, an organized team approach, both at the hospital level, the clinic level, as well as uh, at the level in our own uh, health department. Uh, we need to involve our pulmonary team, our ID team, our internal medicine colleagues, our endocrinologists, our infection control practitioners, our house staff. And we need to involve social services and discharge planners and patient navigators because it's not enough just for the patient to get treated for their tuberculosis and then to be sent out the door without a plan in place for managing their diabetes. And we at the health department want to do exactly the same thing, and we have some of the same challenges. We do have, of course, at our disposal, and we're fortunate to have a, such an excellent uh, laboratory, 
and you have here at your disposal uh, a number of world-class experts who can help you uh, and guide you uh, with your patients. Uh, we also hope as we move forward that we're going to have uh, a, a lot more in the, in the area of community uh, outreach. Our own health department, our standard for managing our TB patients, all of our TB patients uh, with disease is video, uh, video observed, uh, directly observed therapy. Uh, we are very uh, proud of the record that we have and we want to continue it. We offer language support. Uh, so we have colleagues who are able to, uh, to provide this uh, service uh, in the language of the, of the patient most of the time. Most of the patients uh, are Spanish speaking, but some uh, Portuguese. And uh, of course, we have to use other mechanisms as well. And uh, of course, we realize that there are challenges that many of the patients have, and we've been trying to uh, get over some of those challenges by um, being able to provide uh, transportation, uh, for some of the food insecurity issues, we've been able to provide uh, food vouchers for some of our patients when they are eligible for it. And we're doing everything that we can to try to make it uh, easier for the patients uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to stay on therapy. So at this point, I will, uh, I think that's, that's my last slide. And uh, I'll basically just say, so TB and diabetes is the intersection of communicable and non-communicable pandemics. And the lights at the end of the tunnel may be from the two oncoming uh, pandemics, and we'll discuss how we can uh, sort of move to the next step. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Hewlett. In the You're interest welcome. of time, I think we're going to have, if you have any questions, you can sure. approach Dr. Hewlett and sure. ask him, yeah. but thank you so much. You're <laughs> So just want to pull up our thank you slide and help me find it. <laughs> I want to thank everyone, including Dr. Garrick, <laughs> just before she leaves. We want to thank all our speakers for a fantastic presentation learned a tremendous amount, a lot of late-breaking, newsworthy information that we learned today. Dr. Garrick sponsored our coffee break. Uh, Heather helped us with the flyers at the Department of Health. Nicholas is our medical college archivist. And if you saw it during the break, on your way out, we lined it up in the hallway so you could take a look at some more medical history um, related to TB, along with Jerry. Um, Dr. Schluger's assistant helped us with a lot of logistics. Margaret, you met outside with CME. And Michael Cotter helped us with the AV, the Zoom, and everything uh, digital. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for attending. It was great. <laughs>